Our first speaker is Dr. Bindu Pudel Ward. She's an extension plant pathologist and our plant diagnostician here at the Ag Center. She's with Cooperative Extension and she's going to talk about epidemiology of INSV. Uh, I'll start with the introduction uh, about viruses in general and move to the background of INSV. We'll talk a little bit about the, the, the science behind trans, um, transmission, host strains, and a few points on INSV management. And uh, I will end with uh, some of the INSV project that we're doing in the human plant pathology program. So the first definition virus that I picked, there are many of them out there. The one that I picked here is a virus is a submicroscopic biological entity with a nuclear protein constitution lacking cellular organization like most uh, most biological things have uh, viruses do not have cellular organization but they are capable for of replicating exclusively within the host cells there is going to be a, quite a bit of information on the uh, you know uh, the basic science side so if you want me to stop anywhere and explain more please uh, like you don't have to wait until the end of the uh, at the talk, like you can stop me anytime. So the, the definition of living organism is all living creatures are made of cells. That's how we learned, you know, in elementary school, middle school, right? But it doesn't really make sense for the viruses because they are not made of cells. They are autonomous genetic system built of nucleic acids and proteins and uh, because they evolve. So they represent the non-cellular form of life. So me being a virologist, I still believe that it is a form of life and they are living. Um, but they're obligate parasite and they can uh, reproduce only inside cells. Um, mostly over here we're talking about plant viruses, so we're talking about plant cells. So they divide inside plant cells. Now there are some viruses that can actually, plant viruses like tomato spirulina virus, that can actually replicate inside the thrips, uh, thrips cells, like thrips of body as well. But most of them in general, they can amplify, they cannot amplify, replicate only inside a plant cell. So they assemble. So in case of other, uh, other organisms, they reproduce, they bind a diffusion, like they, uh, they divide, right? Or they multiply. Uh, but in case of viruses, they have, they assemble different components and make a new, um, new organism. So talking about how viruses are different from other forms of life, they cannot generate energy because they do not have mitochondria. They do not make uh, membranes, but there are a lot of viruses, especially virions, they are enveloped. So when they move from one cell to another or from one plant to another, they need to have the envelope on them. So when they need that coating, they acquire, which is pretty much still owing, from their host cells. So that's how they make their membrane. They cannot manufacture their pro protein, uh, but they do code for protein. They have genetic uh, material to code for a protein, but they need the host, cell, host machinery to uh, code for the protein or manufacture their protein. So all cells that we know of, they have double-stranded DNA as a genetic material. But viruses, they, have single, they can have single-stranded RNA, they can have double-stranded RNA, they have single-stranded uh, DNA or double-stranded DNA. So genetically, they are actually even more diverse than other, um, um, other cells. Now moving on to how are, but how are they similar with other plant pathogens? So in plant pathology, how are they similar with the other pathogens that infect the plant? They evolve like other plant pathogens like bacteria and fungi, viruses evolve. Um, they can replicate in certain hosts. So for example, uh, the fusarium that infects lettuce only infects lettuce. So there is like host and a pathogen specificity. So it is the same with viruses too. Um, they can only live or survive in specific vectors, and which is a good thing because if you think about it, if every insect transmitted every virus, then we would not have any plants to grow. So the specific, uh, specificity is very important uh, for, for the, the natural control, and there is that, that's, uh, that is contributed by the gene-to-gene -gene or protein-to-protein -protein interaction. So moving on to transmission, there are four types of transmission that, um, uh, that insects um, the, there are four ways that insects transmit viruses. So there's the non-persistent type, which is the stylet burn. So it is mostly by, um, by aphids. So one of the common one is cucumber mosaic virus. So uh, an aphid go and scrap on a, a cucumber, a CMV infected plant for a bit, and then go move on to the next plant and scrap the next plant and you have virus transmission. So it is very quick. Uh, it only takes seconds or minutes for them to acquire the virus. Uh, does not take long to be able to be transmissible, but they do not hold that virus in their system for too long. So it's a quick give, quick receive, and quickly give out. So semi-persistent uh, is mostly um, 
forgot one, which means they take from minutes to hours, they take slightly longer to acquire the virus in their system, and they take slightly as much to transmit the virus to the healthy plants. So they are, the, both of these two, they are not present in the vector's hemolymph, they cannot multiply inside the vector, and there is no transovarial uh, transmission. The two, um, the next two are slightly uh, more complicated. So for persistent circulative, which is the INSV type, it can take from hours or days to acquire the virus. And then they have this latent period, hours or even days, to for, um, for the virus to be, for the insect to be virulifer viruliferous and be able to transmit the virus. And they can stay in the, uh, in, in the three vector, not three vector, the insect vector for days, sometimes weeks, sometimes even the whole lifespan of the insect. They are present in the vector's hemolymph. Uh, the only pro persistent propagative type are the one that can multiply in the vector. That is um, the, one of the common species or the most um, you know, common one is tomato spreader world virus, which thankfully we do not have it here. Uh, with INSV, if a tree is infected, you do not, they, the mother does not pass that those viruses to the office springs. But in case of persistent propagative, which is the tomato spreader world virus, uh, the mother tree can actually pass the virus to uh, to the, the, their office springs. Just a few examples. So non-persistent one that I talked about uh, is mostly transmitted by aphids, cucumber mosaic virus, papaya ring virus, zucchini yellow mosaic virus, watermelon mosaic virus. These are just you know few common, few ones that are, there are like tons of viruses for, for each category. So semi-persistent is mostly by um, aphids and white flies, um, ca cauliflower mosaic virus, latest infectious virus. Uh, the cucurbit yellow stunting, uh, stunting disorder virus that uh, we have in melon is transmitted by white flies in a semi-persistent manner. Persistent circulative, uh, this is where uh, the INSV falls. Uh, and there are, there's more like bit western yellows, um, bit colita virus, etc. Uh, the persistent propagative is tomato spotted world virus. So to give you a, a, a visual of uh, what goes in there, so you have non-persistent like uh, cucumber mosaic virus, those virions, the virus particles, are present in the epidermis, which is the very much outer layer of the plants, where they go, scrap, and then go to the next plant. So the virus, uh, the, the insects acquire the virus present in the outer epidermis, and then the virus stays, just hangs in there around the stylet of the, of the insect. And when the insect goes to the next healthy plant, uh, they get transmitted to the next healthy plant. So that's the non-persistent. So semi-persistent, goes a little bit deeper in the plant, um, in the phloem tissue, and then it goes a little bit farther than the, um, the stylet. It goes all the way to the foregut. So this is the non-transmit, non-persistent, and semi-persistent transmission. For the persistent uh, propagative and persistent uh, circulative, it goes from, um, from the stylet to the foregut, all the way to the hindgut, back to the hemocyl, and back to the salivary gland, and when the insect fits on the, on the healthy plant, through the salivary gland, they get back into the healthy plant. Okay, moving on to, um, I wonder if I can remove this. Uh, impasse necrotic spot virus, um, well, is it actually impasse necrotic spot orthotoxo virus, uh, if you are, you know, trying to be very correct, uh, scientifically correct. Um, just wanted to mention that uh, in terms of plant viruses, the names, they keep changing all the time. There was a time I submitted a manuscript, and by the time it was accepted, the virus name has changed three times, so I had to, like, manually go and change the virus name. Uh, the reason is um, not including medical science or including like human viruses that cause human disease as well as plant disease, uh, they are very, very new um, in, terms of, in terms of research. There is so much that has not been found yet. So every time there's new information, then you have reclassification because you have, there's new information out there that tells that, okay, this is not related to this group and this has to be in this group. So taxonomy itself is, uh, you know, in general, uh, sometimes feel like they change too much, but it changed way a lot more uh, in, plant, in the field of plant virology. So this is what the virus particle looks like. So this is a graphical <coughs> representation. So this is the membrane that I was talking about. So this is the polymerase that helps in replication. There are genetic, the, the genetic segment, the large segment, small segment, uh, um, uh, medium segment. So we cannot see viruses, we all know that. We cannot even see them on microscope. So the only time we see them in the electron microscope but this is like a representation of 
what we see in electron microscope, they do not look like this. So in, actually, they look like this in electron microscope. So this is the variant of cucumber mosaic virus, this is of the alpha mosaic virus, and so on and so forth. So within this uh, variant, we have three segments like I talked about. Um, there is the larger segment, there is the medium segment. So this is, these are the kilobases we're talking about. So they are that, that many bases of DNA. Uh, you know, we don't have to memorize this. But there are just like two, two, three uh, segments. Some viruses only have one segment and just few protein to code for replication. One, co one protein that is responsible for getting inside the cell, one protein for replication, one protein for stealing the membrane and getting out of the cell and just continue on. So it is extremely efficient system. Uh, other viruses that are closely related with um, the INSV is the tomato spider wolf orthotosovirus, tomato chloric sub orthotosovirus, and soybean vein necrosis virus. They all fall within the same group um, on the family orthotosoviridae. So talking about genes and number of genes, this is just a, a representation of, just to give you an idea of how small viruses are. Rice have 60,000 genes. Um, you know, Homo sapiens, um, humans have 24,000, E. coli has 4,000, and a lot of viruses has, you know, have like 10 or, or less. Some, some actually, the virus do not have any genes at all. Moving on to the life cycle uh, of virus. So there is the virus particle that I just showed you in the electron microscope, you know, that you see, that you cannot see. So what does this virus does is it has to go and infect our host DNA. So it has to get inside the host DNA, and then there it goes, and then there it uh, collects all the materials, uh, disassembles, assembly, all of those, and replication happens using the host machinery. And after one virus particle becomes like thousands or even more um, virus particles, they assemble and then they release outside the cells to other, other, uh, to other parts. So this is where the transmission work, transmission comes. So either you can either release from one cell and go move within the plant, like from plasma dispara, dismata, or gylum and phloem, or you, they are carried away to another plant um, using, um, okay, this is all that I already taught. Uh, other plant using insect vectors. So next one, we'll talk about insect transmission. So if in the big picture, uh, there's the, we talked about transmission, we'll talk more about transmission, but in the big picture, we're talking about just this little part of the virus life cycle in the next slide. So uh, INSV, as you all know, is transmitted by the Western flower thrips. So we have the eggs, um, we have the first star larva, second star larva, I know like every, Pretty much each of you in here knows more about uh, insects than I do. Uh, this is just, you know, introduction about or, or some background on um, on thrips. Um, I do have to mention that they uh, they are poor flyers and they rely on wind for dispersal. Um, okay, so looking at the um, the virus acquisition, looking at the life cycle of um, of thrips, we have the egg, we have the first installed larvae, we have the second installed larvae, we have um, the pro pupa, pupa, and the adult, right? So there's the first and second installed larvae that can acquire the virus. So it's a little bit uh, tricky here. So the first and the second installed larvae has to feed on an infected plant to acquire the virus. And they go through pupation, and when they emerge as an adult, they are viruliferous. They have the capacity or capability to transmit the virus. So, uh, so when you are spraying, when you're looking at control, managing the disease, you have to be careful that you have to make sure that you get the first and second install larvae. Just because you don't see it all flying around doesn't mean that you're going to have uh, disease control, right? So you have to make sure, uh, uh, you have to watch out for the first and second install larvae as well as adults. And you know what's even more efficient? If you don't have infected plant at all. So every time you see an infected plant, you have to, you, if you get rid of it, it's much more efficient. And I know it is not always possible if we're, especially if we're doing like hundreds of acres, but you know, like getting rid of infected plant is always um, more efficient for the virus transmission part. And again, you, ha you have the insect damage that you get from, from insect. Okay. All right, um, so this is the same one that we talked before, uh, where the virus gets in um, as a, when the plant in the first and second install larvae, and then when the plant pup uh, when the when the insect pupate, the virus trans the virus particles they transmit in the hemocell, and when it emerges as a grown insect or uh, uh, an adult, then they have the capability to tra uh, to transmit the virus from the salivary gland. Moving on to host range, any questions until about transmission? 
Okay, so as if the whole strains of TRIPS was not enough, uh, we do have a, a virus that also has a very wide host range. It was first found in uh, Italy in 1997 and first reported in the U.S. Um, uh, in Monterey County in 2007. There was a widespread outbreak that we all know in 2020. And the, uh, and the sad part is uh, uh, there are more than 600 plant species that are infected by INSV. So managing the disease, managing, understanding the epidemiology of the, vir the disease uh, makes it much more difficult and trickier. And um, to add to that, it is one of the favorite disease in, not favorite, but you know, like one of the most common disease in ornamental industry. So we heard, we may have heard about INSV here just when it happened a couple of years ago in our, in our area, but uh, INSV has been a huge problem in, uh, in ornamental industry for a while now. So this is just a very small of the smallest list of just the ornamental. So there's no weedy species in here. Uh, the speakers after me are going to talk about it. But this is just the ornamentals that has been affected by the virus. And I'm, uh, I'm, it's not even like the whole list. So as you can see, it has a very, very wide host range. Um, moving on to what happened with, uh, to us, uh, in, um, uh, we had the first report in March 1st in 2021. And we have few samples test for um, positive. Um, um, you know, uh, sometimes I think that I know what INSV looks like, but I have had times where I thought it was INSV and it was not. So it is very important that you always test for INSV diagnosis. Um, we have we have administrators available for anyone for free of charge. So whenever you need it, you can send the samples or you can bring it. Uh, if you want us to come uh, test in the field and do a field visit, we can do that too. But always make sure that you have proper diagnosis. Um, this is Dr. Palumbo's work that he's going to talk next uh, in, his, in his slides. I just, I'm just building a story for what we're going to do in our project. And this is uh, Dr. Slinsky's group's um, uh, report. Um, just to give you an idea that um, about, about the weed uh, sampling, um, weed, uh, alternate host testing that they're doing. So uh, the one that we have in, in, in the plant pathology program in my lab, uh, we have a program uh, on INSV to study the INSV. Uh, we have been funded by the specialty crop Brock grant. So we're trying to do thrips transmission on common crops like melon, cotton, and alfalfa. And we initially, the plan was to do uh, screen the weed host, but, um, but they are already doing, Dr. Sun's group already doing, and Dr. Palumbo, they're already doing an amazing job screening all the viruses, uh, all the weed, uh, weed species. So we thought not to duplicate effort and just to generate more information as we can. We're going to test ornamentals. Um, so if you have, a, oh, sorry. We're going to test the ornamental plants. So uh, we have uh, our postdoc Nirza is here. She's the one doing, uh, doing the work in this. So if you have any questions, you can always uh, email her. Um, so we, this is a, um, the major part of her work that she's going to do um, INSP transmission studies and alpha park cotton. It'll come back right, okay. and cantaloupe. So for the virus transmission studies, uh, what we're going to de do is um, we're going to re 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 rear healthy thrips colonies first, and then feed them on the infected plants. Um, since it is a persistent propagating manner, it might take them hours to feed or, hour, uh, or days. So we were trying to work on the protocol to standardize the test. Um, and then after that, we three have those thrips feed on uh, healthy plants like melon, alpha, alpha, cotton. And then we'll be testing those healthy plants by TAS ELISA and RT-PCR. This is um, the protocol that we have so far where we're going to raise the thrips. When we have first instar larvae or second instar, that's where we're gonna try to have those larvae acquire the virus. And then when they pupate and emerge as um, an adult, we will put them in healthy plant and, and do the, try to do the transmission. And then once they feed on the plants, the plant still have to be incubated for seven to 14 days for the virus symptom to develop or the virus to be detectable, and then we'll test the plants. So you probably have seen this, uh, um, um, this slide from me and, and um, the people actually doing it multiple times. So there is not any positive that you can see. So you might be thinking like, why are you wasting your time and energy trying to test those? But if you look at the number of samples, 118 feels like a lot, right? Uh, 20 is not a lot, 21 is not a lot. But 118 may feel like a lot, but if you look at the amount of acres and number of those plants that we have out in the field, this number is very little. 
So what we're trying to do is instead of trying to sample like thousands and thousands, uh, that will take a lot of time, uh, money, and energy, we are trying to create the situation where we are giving the virus and the, the trees everything they want, and we're trying to, you know, uh, trying to do the actual transmission in vitro or in the lab. So it's not actually in vitro, it is in the lab. So we're trying to facilitate all of that and to see, giving them the best case scenario to see if they actually transmit the virus. So, so far in the project update, we did the mechanical transmission, which we are um, um, doing with some buffers and things like that to trying to transmit the, the, uh, the virus from uh, uh, infected latest to healthy plants. And so far we have been negative. So we, we kind of think that uh, they might be negative or they, may, they are not the host, but we definitely need to do enough, um, enough studies to confirm that they are not the host. So uh, the thing that we're trying to get from this is cotton, alfalfa, um, melons, they are our green braids from, one, uh, from a spring uh, lettuce to, uh, spring lettuce to uh, fall lettuce. So if they are the host, then we can't blame, blame Salinas anymore that, oh, they are already here, right? But if we do experiments and confirm that they are not the host here and we do not have as many um, uh, reservoir in the here and then if we have this um, scenario where every time we have a transplant or we, in the new season we get few samples and then we get secondary spread on the next crop then uh, we can, we, we will get, ha we'll have an idea that you know they might be coming from transplant and that will allow us to have better management practices to make sure that we don't get, um, you know, we, get, or we'll get, uh, we have a better handle over managing the disease incidence. So we're going to do two more mechanical transmission to see to confirm our results, and then we will also do thrift transmission. So if you do mechanical transmission, they are not the host. We do thrift transmission, they are not the host. Then it, and then uh, uh, we have we're doing some field surveys. So at that point, I think we can be uh, we can be sure that they are not the host after two uh, experiments. So ornamental plants. Uh, so yeah, we, we are trying to going to test all the ornamental plants. Uh, so if you have any in your house, in the field, um, so anytime you think that you have an ornamental plant that could have the virus, please let us know. We'll come and collect samples and test, and you give you the results. We are also going to do. I don't know if I have right, but but uh, we're also going to test uh, the plants from the nurseries in terms of like seedlings and um, flowering plants from places like Home Depot and Lowe's. So for to prepare for the next season, uh, of course you have to. This has been um, uh, we have had this before. So always start with uh, clean transplants. We have had secondary spread, or we don't have much many incidents in the first field, but then it, it spreads secondary. So at that point, you have to um, uh, uh, work on your uh, insect transmission, and of course uh, make sure that uh, you start with clean cultivation. Um, and field sanitation and um, insect management is very important because uh, it has been found that high insect pressure is not required for efficient transmission. So there could be like few thrips flying around and you could still have efficient transmission of disease, the viruses. To anytime you want to bring the sample uh, to the plant pathology lab, you can bring it anytime. So all you have to do is uh, this form is available online, so you just Google human plant pathology and then it will take you to the diagnostic clinic and you can, uh, you can download the file, you can make as many copies as you want. Um, if you are sending it by mail and if you are out of state like um, California, you do need to send it with the, the permit that, can also, that you can also download from the website. Or you can email me and I can send you the permit. So that is all from the program. Just to give you a brief outlook, we do have the diagnostic clinic for your service. Anytime you need, uh, you need help with plant disease diagnosis, we also do field visits. So whenever you need me to come out there and look at your fields to give an idea that uh, where could have any come from or what we can do, I'm always available. And we have the extension lab that way we have uh, um, ex um, applied field re applied research projects. Uh, for the plant disease uh, things, um, diagnostic clinic, we get about 200, 300 samples every year, and then uh, we do about 100 to 150 uh, field or home uh, disease diagnosis. Um, this is the whole people in the program. I, I and I'm in paper. I run the program, but I just run my mouth. Um, Martin actually takes care of all the field trials, so all the results that you get um, about the field trials that you're having. Uh, Martin does most of it. Uh, Jason takes care of the diagnostic clinic, and Nerja is working on the INSP project and other um, funded projects, um, extra projects that we have in the lab. And we're also hiring one more field take and a postdoc, which uh, may take a while. It, um, our HR system is very quick. 
So uh, if you have not uh, subscribed for the IPM newsletter, you can send an email on any of those two. So you get the newsletter every other Wednesday. And that is all I have for today. If you have any more questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. <laughs> so our next speaker is uh, Tony Alameda. That last name may sound familiar. He actually works for Steve. <laughs> 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 no, uh, Tony is actually a grower, part partner in, in Top Bay Performance. He's also the chair of the, what do you call it, the Grower Shipper Association of Salinas <laughs> or something like that. And he's also the chair of the INC Task Force, which I've been able to participate in the last year or so. And that's, that's been invaluable because of the exchange of information from everybody involved. So it sure made sense to have Tony come in and talk to us and share his perspective on what's going on. OK. All right. You guys hear me OK? All right. So Tony Alameda, brother to Steve, Top Flavor Farms. I'm the northern half up there. And that area being from, if anybody knows Salinas, Chular region to Casherville, all the way over to San Juan Batista, over there. This whole issue, unbeknownst to us, I've been dealing with it probably for the last eight, nine years. We just didn't really know. In fact, I was probably blaming most of you guys for spraying our fields and burning it overnight. God darn it, I can see those scalded plants out there. But there'd always be just a one, one and two plants. It wasn't, wasn't the decimation that we're seeing today. 2020 is what really brought it to the forefront right now. And it was, I don't know, it's just a, the, the weather, right. the condition, right. the, the conditions and stuff that all came together in 2020, the summer of 2020, it was probably August. I'm probably going to cut into Daniel's timelines here. But we had some monsoonal moisture kind of similar to what you guys are dealing with right now, about this time of year. That was all those fires hit Salinas up there in those hills. And holy smoke, did it smoke everything. So the little losses that I was suffering, mainly in October, late September, hit in August. And we're talking all fields. And I'm, I am just south of Salinas, call it the Firestone area, the Firestone plant, those that are familiar with it. And it just wiped out those fields. So. That kind of brought it to the forefront. I happened to be on Grower Shipper Association at that time. And I started bringing more people out and trying to get people to pay attention to it. Um, I'd say the one positive thing that really came out of the whole experience was the fact that we started bringing um, some of our representatives out, our supervisors out, getting everybody paying attention to the losses. All of a sudden, we're starting to get uh, Secretary of Ag, Karen Ross. Um, we're starting to get funding. Uh, maybe Daniel will bring that up a little bit, but the funding for some of the projects, some of the research all started coming together. There was a million dollar grant that came into the area to specifically go after this problem. It's kind of uh, coincidental right now. I just sent a sample in a few, day, a few days ago last week to Steve Kowicki. He's doing his own private work now. And we sent some samples in to identify what this mess is, and it's the same thing. I, I, I look at a field and we all talk INSV, but we know there's a lot more going on out there. And that sample just came back, positive INSV, positive fuse, uh, um, verticillium, um, what the heck, positive black root. Um, it had four, four different things on it. And you don't even know where to start out there. The one comment made, I think, uh, wind vectored the thrip. If we're going to sit here and focus on something from a grower's perspective, where do I plant? What do I do? How do I strategize from year to year? We're all trying to get out of the way of this problem. We do a pretty good job in the springtime, although there's some interesting stuff we'll talk about there. It starts picking up the pace now. It starts picking up in August, maybe late July. It really starts coming on. It's the second turn of our crops up there, the numbers build up, the infections keep spreading, and you're trying to get out of harm's way. And I don't, I, I, maybe the, the thrip are vectored by wind or pushed by the wind a little bit. 
and so therefore you'll sit there and tell some, hey, there's strawberries nearby. I don't want to be downwind from the strawberry. There's organic. I don't want to be down from the organic guy. If I got a bunch of open space, a bunch of grass and everything, I'll look out for the grass. So you're sitting there trying to position yourself, and yet you'll have this perfect plan laid out, and it goes completely opposite of what you think. There's one phenomena that's beginning to sh take shape, and we keep getting an early hit in the springtime. We're all trying to gap this thing out, trying to get this INSV free period. In theory, we're supposed to be out of uh, our, our mosaic periods and all that. We're supposed to have all of our lettuces gone. Now we're all preaching to get all the weeds wiped out of the area, all the host weeds. When you look at that list that she had up there of all the, the ornamentals, I don't know how you ever get out of the way clear of that mess. But if you're near a vineyard, odds are you're going to get hammered early. I can be out in the middle of the field, the first crop of the year, in the middle of nowhere, near nobody, and there's INSV pops up right in the middle of the ranch. Where in the hell did that come from? I have no idea. Other than I don't know how you don't have the egg that's somehow in that soil. I don't know how I don't have the previous year's vegetation that I just dissed in in November. I don't know if that's the connecting. Is, is that egg feeding? Is that going through the cycle? And boom, I'm getting hit in April. Not heavy, but we see that. I don't know if that's something that, imp and I'm just talking strictly observations and things. I have no proof of any of this. It's just stuff that I've witnessed over the, the last eight, nine years. And the percentages, the numbers, the infections typically keep increasing. So I don't know. You guys seem to be breaking the cycle down here. I got to understand that with the, the amount of heat out there, I don't know anything can survive. John, you'd be, be you'd be better off with a field trip. Take, take everybody a field trip in Salinas right now. We can have this discussion out in those fields, and you can see it live. <laughs> That'd be worthwhile probably for everybody. But the, um, the, one, the one takeaway I have on the whole thing, I don't know what the heck we're doing still. I play with the varieties. We watch our varieties tight. We move our crops in where we know we have typical hot spots. We move um, non-host items in. We're trying to um, identify all possible varieties that have a little bit more tolerance. I don't know if we have true resistance, but maybe there's a little more tolerance to some of the issues here. Is the INSV the, the gateway for all the other issues that come into that plant, all the other secondary infections that are coming in? Possibly is what's happening on that. Um, so that's one of our strategies. Yeah, we're doing auto thinning. We're putting, we're putting sprays on when that thing is as small as can be. And we're putting high amounts of concentration right over the top of that plant early on. I come back, I hit it again. Sometimes the harder I hit it, the better chance I have of success. Messing around with, with I hate to say, non-lanate issues and stuff, which I know that's a problem as we keep hammering with lanate, which isn't going to be probably here forever anyway, I'm better off with the lanate. Old school, but that seems to be doing better. Um, when we first, 2020 was a disaster. 21, we, had, we, we talked about had representatives, had more money coming in. We we're right along the 101 corridor. Yeah, all this is happening during pandemic to boot. So we're having this whole meltdown in 2020, 2021. You can't even get anybody to give you a hand. You can't even get anybody to mow down weeds. We're having to work with all of our neighbors. I happen to be next to the Firestone Business Park, working with neighbors over there to get all their weeds cleared out. The, 101, the Highway 101 corridor is right through Salinas Valley, having to work with Caltrans, trying to get them to cooperate, taking down weeds on there. Um, I always get the perception that Yuma, Arizona, does a better job at working with ag, getting a little more cooperation. We seem to be fighting that over there. Maybe I feel that because I'm a grower shipper and I, I see all the activity and it seems like we're losing the, the, uh, the luster of agriculture in our area, I will say. But that's just me personally thinking about that. Um, I don't know, D Daniel, I wish I was hoping Daniel would be here live because uh, he's been fantastic. That guy's a wealth of knowledge. He, he works his butt off. He's doing some unique things. 
out there. Um, he's got, and, and I don't know, he probably doesn't want to present it because it's not fact at all, but some of the things he's doing, the observations he has, and then he starts throwing it at you. Well, what do you think? And you start seeing uh, little patterns of temperatures and warmth and where these things are starting. Um, east, eastern orientation into your fields, into areas, it's, it's, it's crazy. And, uh, and I have no idea. Is it, is it a function of temperature, warmth in the morning? Salinas Valley, it's cold, okay. Thrips like a little bit more heat. <laughs> but those are the observations we're seeing. I have any solutions. Right now, it is move out of harm's way, move the crops that are, are vulnerable out of the way. And in the meantime, I'm watching the markets go berserk out there. The prices are up. And you want to make sure you have some product. And I think we'll all understand that, that there's opportunity when these disasters hit. And you want to be in the game. And you're doing everything you can to figure it out. You guys seem to have it pretty good right now. I don't see a huge disaster coming on you yet, John. Or I don't see a huge disaster building on you at this point. I'm reserving that comment for now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to talk to that. Yeah, but it, it is a huge problem. I don't think it's ever going to get solved until we have genetics. I think we're just trying to kick this can down the road, hang in there as best we can. Hopefully there's genetics coming into some of these varieties and that'll be our solution as to what, uh, how we deal with this in the future. All right. the, the chemistry, the chemicals, I don't, uh, hold on. I'm, hoping, I'm hoping I have solutions when I leave here right now, John. I got to take something back to save the farm. So anyway, that's, that's probably the majority of what I have to say. Any questions or anything? Hammer away, if not, good. Do you know table grapes have an issue with Western Bonifer, Southern San Joaquin Valley? Mm -hmm. Your wine grapes. Oh, I'd love to point the finger at somebody else. <laughs> okay. And then secondly, on your farm, is it mostly Romaine that you're... It's, it's that is the, the, the sample I was describing was Iceberg that I just had. So it is Iceberg Romaine typically. Green Boston, you know, it's those. Um, other items, we've, we grow a lot of different things from endives and escrows to, to the cilantros and all that stuff, and none of that seems to be affected. Um, but it's, it's your lettuces primarily that are out there. You know, when I, and you say wine grapes, we talk about the weeds within the wine grapes. Maybe not so much the plant itself, but maybe underneath the plant. You know, the strawberry has a ton of thrip out there. And it still has to get the infection to spread it across your fields and stuff. So that's, that's probably more of our concern there. Um, I just try to stay away from them. The second half, I try not to be downwind with a vulnerable crop to something that, uh, such as a strawberry or be adjacent to a grape, something like that, stay away. Just take, put something else in that area right there. But I plant all that, and the next thing I know, it pops up completely out of the blue, contrary to what your thoughts were. It shows up somewhere else. So, good question. Anybody else? Okay, I got one. Are you hearing any rumors, or has anybody started to get concerned about resistance, this particular landing, what the usage? Over the last three seasons, over an 11-month period. Usage, or what are you saying? Yeah, with the heavy usage of rain, oh, yeah. in particular, and any gradient, any rumors or anybody complaining about good performance? I, nobody, I mean, I'm not getting that yet. I mean, we're, we're all assuming that that's, that's short-lived right now, as far as that usage there. But hopefully you've got some solutions to what else we can replace that. <laughs> Who's got Bill? What do you got for me? You got something good over there? You know, Tony, I was thinking, have you seen, like, in that turnaround time from that crop to crop, does it get progressively worse from the second time? Or can you see it kind of, you have it in the first plant, go around and come back, turn it around, plant it again? Do you have more? Or can you? I'm, I'm assuming it's more, but I will have a brassica crop and then move back into lettuce right there, and boom, it'll be right on top of me. So it's like, all right, I came behind a no host, but then the neighbor might have had something right here. When the first was going on, where 2020, you swore you have point of entry into your fields. It felt like, ah, uh, it came in that way. You can see the pattern where it was flowing out. You always kind of felt that. I'm not seeing that as much anymore. 
I don't know. Maybe there's so much the numbers out there. I don't know. But I think you're correct because the numbers build, the thrip build, everything. And Daniel's got some great stuff if he ever gets on the screen here. His correlation in the thrip, the temperature, and everything else, and the infections out there. The, the, this whole process is, has brought the, 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 the INSV task force together. Um, we do a pretty good job of, t of talking. You know, the, everybody's re theoretically, everybody's reporting where they're seeing 2% or greater in the field, been using 2%, you know. Um, but they don't pinpoint exactly. It's, it's kind of like food safety. I'm not going to tell you exactly where I got that hit. And nobody wants to be fingered. But we kind of measure certain areas. We kind of chopped up Monterey County into different zones and stuff. And it just gives generic, you know, here's 15 new reports, North Salinas, you know, South Salinas, boom. We, we just kind of do that. We don't sit there and pinpoint everybody's field. Nobody wants to get fingered as being a hotbed for INSV. And so, you know, after so many years now, everybody appears to be getting their turn in the barrel. It just seems like it's moving around. Cooler temperatures are probably safer bet to not get it. Therefore, that shoves you right to the coast tighter. Odds, odds are that direction, cooler temperature. But then I put them out in the middle of the hot weather. I put them over in San Juan. I put them in it, the, because there's less lettuces in the, in the hotter zones of uh, San Benito County. Maybe a little more isolation out there. So you, you also see that phenomenon. I just, whereas the Blanco district, it's cool, but there's a lot of lettuce right there. And can the numbers build up? But I, so far that Blanco has been pretty strong out there in general, just an observation. So I'm a little envious when I look, drive through that blank. It looks pretty good. So, all right. Just observation, because we seem to have a lot more in, out by the mall and out that way. What does that know? <clears throat> yeah, it's just observation. I mean, I don't know where they have typed it. We seem to have a lot out in North Salinas. When you, when you start getting to Old Stage Road, you start getting to those grass, you're also in High Strawberry. You know, probably a little bit warmer, open pastures along the hills. I had some stuff out there. I got my ass kicked. <laughs> it just, it just hammered us. Not quite there. a bit in the Blanco area too. In, in, it, it'll happen. It'll happen. But there's, there's worse spots than others, and so. And in last year, it seemed like it was cool. It was pretty clean South County. Now I see numbers up there that are tremendous. And I think you end up moving to these areas. You probably end up loving it to death, looking to hide out from it. And then you over, overpopulate, and here, here it comes following you into those areas. So it happened. So what do you got? What do you want to share? Yeah, I got nothing. It's in there holding your hands tight. Uh, we've done studies internally. Land 8 on a good day, 50% efficacy. So if you have 20 crimp, you're only going to kill 10. Um, and with the way they're populating, it's hard to stand from it. I did get an email yesterday. I don't know if there's court that or court that divesting line. Yeah. So I don't know what that's going to be supply wise. It's going to be interesting. Hmm. All right. Maybe we could have a court telegraph respond to that right now with the situation. <laughs> <laughs> if there's anybody here that could do that. I know what guys, I know what guys see. Uh, yeah, if you don't know, we divested that product as of uh, midnight on Monday. So uh, Nova Source TKI is the new owner. And uh, if you need to place an order, place your order with TKI. All right. But yeah, I hate to see it go. DuPont uh, had it since 1968. Well, I think I'll start off with a little rumor that I heard before this meeting. Um, something about getting thrips vaccinated and masked. And um, <laughs> I don't know if Bill Fox is there or not. But, uh, <laughs> tied to him but anyways I uh, wanted to bring that up because if uh, if that's what it's going to take to get this problem fixed I'm, I'm totally on board so anyways the second thing I wanted to say is I'm, I'm actually happy to follow up after uh, Bindu and Tony presented because I think they've really built a great foundation for the work that I'll be talking about and you know what to Tony's point you know all of his stuff is observational, but honestly, that's all of research as well. It's a different level of observation, and it's our job just to just to quantify those observations. And you'll see 
a lot of that work um, that I'll be talking about today and how we've been able to make some progress based on the feedback from Tony and other people from the task force. So um, let's go ahead and just jump right into it, kind of an outline uh, of just what I'll be talking about. I'm not going to talk a lot about the biology because Bindu did a really good job of that. Um, but most of the stuff is new stuff. I just pulled it together last night and the day before. Um, some of our Salinas people are aware of some of this work, but um, you're the first to really see it in the form of a, a formal presentation. So would love any feedback on it. I think it's some really exciting stuff, but uh, let's go ahead and just start with the first part of it. Um, just a reminder on symptomology. I think everyone knows what it looks like, but it's always good to have reminders. And as Bindu said, tomato spotted wilt virus looks essentially the same. I don't know if that virus has been documented down there. So INSV might be your number one candidate there, but you know, this plant on the left is, uh, is actually infected. And when you pull back some of these outer leaves, you'll start to see the onset of symptoms right here. And so um, the way that I was able to spot this plant is that the heart is, is quite stunted in the middle of it. And so that, that led me to go in and dig a little bit further and see those early symptoms coming in. Um, advanced symptoms, we all know what this looks like. Strong necrosis, that's where the virus gets its name from. Um, alternative sim symptoms as you go into your season, depending on the variety, it can look very different. So uh, all of these necrotic spots that are in the ribbing right here in the mid ribs, we actually tested that and that's actually virus. And so from a field perspective, it looks pretty good. Um, just make sure you're looking thoroughly throughout the whole plant. Same thing that we're seeing in one of our, uh, in a romaine type here where you see that necrosis very, very deep within the heart of the plant, but also on those lower mid ribs. So um, why that's happening, I'm not sure, but I think as we continue to get new varieties and develop some um, resistance, uh, that is something to certainly keep, a, keep an eye out for and just know that it can take different shapes and forms depending on the genetic background that you're working with. Um, and then here, of course, is, is the most severe form that everyone is uh, aware of. And this is, you know, the very strong stunting of the heart, um, different levels of infection within a field. Uh, transmission by the Western flower thrips. Populations are quite large here in the Salinas Valley. Infestations can be pretty heavy. Um, again, won't spend a lot of time here just because Bindu already covered it, but um, the main thing just to reemphasize here is that the virus has to be acquired at this first larval stage in order for them to transmit it as adult. They have two different um, phases of growth in the foliage and the soil, which makes management challenges even more difficult because one shot of lanate may not, may not be able to get down into the soil and clean up these in the soil. Um, so anyways, just keep that in mind in terms of how you're managing the field and just what to look for in terms of the different growth stages of the insect. Um, finally, um, we've talked about this before, and I know John's done a good job about emphasizing this in his talks as well as that in order for a plant to be a good host um, for INSV, it also has to be a reproductive host for the Western flower thrips, and that's because they have to acquire it at this stage. They're not that mobile. They can crawl around on the plants, but essentially, the egg has to be laid into an infected uh, piece of tissue, and then the this first larval stage emerges, and then they acquire that, that virus. So we'll come back to this with some of the studies that we've done this past summer. Um, monitoring, uh, Tony mentioned that, that we're right at the cusp, that we're heading into, our, into the prime time part of our season when we typically see populations start to go up. And that's what we're starting to see on course with what we've been tracking since 2019. So um, one thing I'll, I'll note are these populations that are surging even, even during the winter time. Um, I'll talk about temperatures in a, in a little bit as well, but as you expect, and as we know that typically correlates with when we see INSV start to go up uh, as our populations start to rise as well. Uh, air temperature from the past 20 years, this is from the Salinas Valley from, from a single station. Um, overall, the take home message here is that 
temperatures are rising. They're not the same as what we've seen 20 years ago. And if you look at the average lows um, from 2020 to 2021, they've risen um, quite a bit, maybe, I don't know, three degrees. It's hard to see there, but that's significant for 20 years. And why that's important is because this red line is the minimum temperature for thrips to develop. And so you can see that separation from that minimum lower temperature to that line from which thrips require um, that warmth to start developing. And why that's important is because, you know, as I mentioned before, we're starting to see greater reproduction and activity of adults in the winter time. Maybe that wasn't the case 20 years ago. It's hard to say because we don't have that data, but it's certainly a, a, a big, a major point in terms of thinking about, you know, what has changed over the past 20 years in correlation with, you know, why IMC is surging recently. So certainly has to do with, with um, different vector populations, in my opinion. Um, epidemiology discrepancies in scouting. So um, again, this is, this is touching on uh, some points that ben, Bindu and um, Tony have talked about, and this is just the way that we've been able to quantify it. So this is, you know, progressing, uh, looking at the progression of this disease over a nine week period. And so you can see that the severity, each one of these cells represents an individual plant. You can see the disease severity increase. And, we, and when we run um, geospatial modeling of how that actually aggregates in the pink is actually where you get strong aggregated effects of the virus. And so um, basically what's, what this is saying is that the virus is coming in on this edge of the field. I don't think anyone would question that if you saw this field, but you know, our job here is to quantify those observations and that's what this is showing. When we look at thrips populations in the same field, a very different story, right? If you, instead you see in pink again, where we capture all the thrips, they're coming in on all edges of the field. And we don't see that strong aggregated effect in the bottom right side of the field. And so that is the discrepancy that I'm alluding to in terms of scouting is that just because you see thrips in certain areas doesn't always mean you see virus. In certain cases, that's true, but that's the fundamental challenge in managing insect vectors and insect transmitted viruses. One thing to point out is that week three, we didn't recover any thrips from our sampling in this field. And that goes back to Bindu's point that this virus can be transmitted within minutes. The, the plant is much smaller. This was right after thinning. And so presumably you're getting close to 100% coverage um, of those leaf tissues. And so you're getting complete kill on those plants. But if those, if those thrips were there and feeding for you know, a minute, that's, that's part of the reason why we're seeing introduction of the virus at such an early stage. And so the take home message here is that the presence of thrips does not always equal the presence of INSV. And so keep that in mind as you continue to scout your fields this season. Um, the second point here is that there's always a delay in INSV symptoms after infection. And so this was um, something we just quantified. We've done it several times. This is just one field that we did last month where we sampled 20 plants every single week. Um, so week three, again, at thinning, we sampled 20% um, of our plants tested positive, but only, uh, what is that, 5% of them were, were actually showing symptoms. And you continue to see that lag in terms of, you know, the symptoms, but actually more plants are testing positive. And so, again, that's another discrepancy uh, in our scouting and something that we have to keep in mind is that what you're seeing um, in terms of symptomology doesn't necessarily represent the true infection rate within that field. And, and you may actually see it develop further as you progress through the season. So keep that in mind. Um, post range. So I've talked quite a bit about this in the past. Um, and so, you know, I won't go into all the details of how we did this, but we've narrowed it down to our top 10 hosts. Um, this is based on 4,000 samples that we've tested over the course of about a year and a half, narrowed it down to here. We've worked with Richard Smith just to, just to get a, a very basic sheet in terms of the, preven, uh, the prevalence of these different hosts 
throughout the year. And a lot of these are considered annual, but because of the moderate climate on the central coast, we see these plants like little mallow that are present essentially every season throughout the year. And what that means is that these can potentially be hosting virus throughout the entire year, especially during the winter time during our lettuce free period. So unique climate creates unique parameters for how the weeds and the virus is gonna perform within our region. Um, if we break out you know, all of the samples that we've tested so far, we strategize these different sampling periods. You've seen a lot of this data, but really all this is saying is that we have this green bridge where a lot of our um, weeds are testing positive for virus specifically during this lettuce free period and throughout the winter time period. And so that emphasis of how do we break the cycle is something that we inevitably cannot avoid. It's something that we must continue to think about and try to address. And that may challenge some of our existing cultural practices in the Salinas Valley. But I think ultimately that's going to be one of our major um, challenges and, and, and things that we need to address in terms of reducing the amount of virus that's within the Salinas Valley. If we break out those samples by location, um, over here on the east side, along that old stage road, as Tony mentioned, um, that's where we typically see a lot of our weeds uh, that have tested positive the most. So look at that rate. It's almost 30% of everything that we've tested over on the east side has been positive. And so um, why aren't we seeing it as much in the south? You know, these are really big questions and we have a lot of projects to try to address these, these different, these different um, uh, pieces of the puzzle. So um, I wanna mention, uh, I mentioned this in the beginning that in order for an INSV infected plant to be a good host, it has to be a reproductive host for thrips. And so we've gone back and revisited our top 10 list uh, and we've done field sampling and we've collected 10 plants per species here. And we've actually quantified the number of adults and the nymphs, which is the, the required stage for acquisition to occur. And we see that in all of our 10 plants or 10 described hosts, we get reproduction on all of them. So um, again, not too surprising here, but it's always good to have strong data that supports the claims that we're making. So. Um, anyways, continuing down this line of work, um, we're working to test those thrips um, to see to see how much of them actually have the virus as well. So that will hopefully be something I talk about in the future. Um, thrips flower surveys. Western flower thrips don't have their name as flower thrips for nothing. They love flowers. It's absolutely true. They love that pollen source because it's a source of protein for them and they need that protein source for active reproduction and good leg, uh, egg laying. And so what we wanted to do was actually start surveying everything that's flowering in the Salinas Valley. And this was spearheaded by a grant that we got, but then also uh, by an awesome team of students that are motivated to get out there and, and do some of this work for the industry. And so uh, on the left here in green, we have crops and then on the right here in yellow, we have non-crops. This idea of strawberry is absolutely true. And so um, Tony talks about the observation about berries and artichokes. And, you know, for every 10 flowers, we're seeing over 70 thrips, adult thrips, uh, for every 10 flowers that we've collected from strawberry so far. And that represents eight different samples with each sample representing 10 flowers. The artichoke, um, um, artichoke, these are actually the buds of the flower, so not actually allowing them to flower, but as you start peeling back those layers of the bud, um, there are quite a few thrips in there. We've all kind of known this, but again, it's good to actually get some data on this as well. Broccoli, cauliflower, commonly rotated coal crops, um, they're all here, in here as well and then a variety of other wild species that we've started to test. We're continuing this project and hope to continue to update you as we get more data on this. Last thing I'll do is we've te tested some of the thrips from these plants and we are actually finding virus in those thrips. Um, as I've talked about before, strawberry and radish, I don't think we have not confirm that it's a host for INSV. And so the likely scenario here is that those thrips 
are actually feeding on an INSV infected plant somewhere else and then moving into the strawberry uh, flowers there. And that's when we're recovering them. So just wanted to point that out, but that's the second layer of, the of data that we're trying to resolve in this slide here as well. Uh, Thrips Choice Studies, Feeding and Reproduction. This is stuff that we're working on with Kelly Richardson, a breeder at USDA. And so when we start talking about resistance to INSV, there's always that question of, if you don't see the virus in a certain variety, is it because it's truly resistant or is it because the thrips don't like feeding on it? And maybe they're just not going to it as much. And so we've conducted a lot of these studies in our greenhouses this past summer to start to address this. These are a variety of different lines that Kelly recommended for us. They planted it for us. Um, she's got some data on INSV here. And what we did was we assessed um, in these choice studies, how many adults were captured on all of these different varieties two weeks after infestation and how much were they reproducing on there? So how many immatures? And there's actually a good spread here, not so much in the adults, but, but in terms of the immatures. So super interesting information. And what we'll do is hand this back over to Kelly and see if she has any genetic linkages that might start help to um, sort some of these differences out as well. So um, same thing, if we look at the same varieties, how many, uh, how much feeding is actually occurring. Uh, and again, there are some differences. And so we're, we're scoring it by scarring damage on the leaves here as well. So not huge differences, but there are some differences that, that we're gonna try to look into in terms of the genetic backgrounds of these different types. Um, and then the last thing, height studies. Um, it's been a big topic. We've, uh, we've addressed these in the past, uh, but we're revisiting them based on some of the questions that have come up this past year. So we know they're, thrip, they're poor flyers. Just look at their wings. There are these weak bristles that they have. They're not true wings. And so they rely heavily on the wind. Distance is super hard to es estimate, um, but there are other ways that we can try to assess um, dispersal. Some of the stuff that we talked about uh, from 2020 and 2021 is this, this um, spread in terms of how high they're flying in the wind column. This time we wanted to really dig deeper and ask some of these bigger questions of, you know, are we seeing different effects in terms of the direction that they're coming in, in terms of the location that it's happening, and is it seasonal as well? And so um, the studies that, that, we've, that we're engaged in right now is looking at location. We have six locations. We're calling this Castroville. It's mainly the Blanco area. We have some studies in the Spreckles area, Spence East, Trular East, which is right around that old stage corridor, Gonzalez West and Soledad West. We're addressing four different heights. Um, we're looking at the direction, so true north, east, south, west, and just keep in mind that when we talk about direction here, I, we often in the industry here and in the valley refer to this direction as north, but we're actually addressing true north here, um, so cardinal direction, so true north, east, south, and west. Uh, and then time, we're addressing uh, one week periods, we've got six weeks of data. We've only processed the first three. So that's what I'll be talking about today. If we summarize everything so far, um, over three weeks, we're seeing a massive amount of thrips being captured in our Trular East location. Um, interestingly, that's where we see the most virus um, in our weedy species from those surveys that we did before. And that's also where we tend to see a lot of virus incidents in lettuce. Why that is, we're still trying to figure that out. And I think we're on to something with some of these studies here. Uh, in terms of the number of thrips, same kind of trend. We're capturing them pretty high. So look at even eight to nine feet, we're capturing up to 2,000 thrips over the course of three weeks pretty equally distributed, but four to five feet tends to be our, our, our sweet spot in terms of the studies that we did here. And then finally, true directions. Most of our thrips that we've captured are coming in from the east. And that's really interesting. And then major, actually majority of the thrips that were coming in from the east were actually coming in from this true largest location. We haven't separated out the individual locations yet, 
but we do see some differences between all of these locations in the Salinas Valley. And so again, just another layer in terms of trying to understand what the heck's happening in the Salinas Valley and responding to a lot of the great observations that the industry is reporting. But this data here is going to be able to be cut and looked at, you know, six different ways. And we hope to do that once all of these all of these studies are complete. So finally, reporting. Um, really, this is the work from Chris Valadez and Mary Zisti and the grower shipper and everyone part of the task force. I mentioned this last year, 2021, 766 fields, about 25% of the industry reporting. Uh, the update for 2022 reporting started a little bit earlier in March. We have greater representation from the industry, which is awesome. Uh, and we're up to 541 fields right now. And so we continue to work together on identifying hotspots, but also track this and get some economic dollars onto it because ultimately that drives support and the research that we do. So with that, I, I think I'm done. Um, thank you again for everyone, John, Stephanie, everyone been new for this opportunity to talk remotely. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be there at the Southwest Ag, Ag um, Summit in the spring. So I look forward to seeing you all. Thank you all. Daniel, yeah, you know, he asked the third bar chart you had, how do you know which direction they're coming in? Yeah, so that, uh, <clears throat> so actually everyone is probably familiar with the sticky cards. And then the other thing that they sell are those sticky rolls. And so at our locations, we have these telephone poles and we actually set up these sticky rolls around the telephone pole. And then we take out our compass and we mark on the sticky roll what is the boundaries of true north and true east and true south and true west. And so when we take those out off of the after a week, we're able to actually categorize them and assign them to the direction. Um, at this meeting last year, we kind of concluded that we really didn't know as much as we wanted to know about this, this whole path of system in terms of the vector of drift as well as INSB. So myself, uh, Samuel Disco, and Stephanie Fensky, we really started out a, pro a couple several projects to really dig in to try to better understand the dynamics, the population dynamics of the thrips, their host range, and, and where they're going from there. So what I want to show, I want to share with you this, this afternoon is some of the work that, that I've been doing uh, as my part of this team to, um, to kind of better explain where we're at, as, as well as uh, some of the newer stuff that's available for insect control. I think, I think you'll be, you might uh, be pleasantly surprised that there's actually some new stuff in the pipeline. Well, anyway, what we, what we, at least the, the role that I've been playing is I was trying to answer three questions. I was trying to understand thrips movement, thrips, thrips activity during the course of the year, not only on lettuce, but in the cropping system. Trying to get a better handle on INSV itself, doing some monitoring on ISV, and then looking at some, some uh, alternative approaches to thrips management, above and beyond lanate and radiant, uh, and those other ones. So with that, I'm going to first start off with some of the sticky trap work we've been doing. Just like Daniel described his sticky traps, ours are, are very similar. We use a 360-degree sticky trap, a cylinder like you, like you saw right there. We wrap that long sticky trap in a cylinder so you get omnidirection, thrips moving from any direction. They're not very good flyers, but obviously you saw, you saw what Daniel showed you. They do move, and that's what these sticky traps tell you is they kind of describe movement. So I'm gonna show you some of the data that we've had. Historically, we have our, our area-wide trapping network that I've had for 10 years now, stretches all the way from Texas Hill all the way down to San Luis over to Bard, 16 traps. And this is the data just for thrips over the last three years where we, we took it the entire year from September to August. And basically what you see is there's two key periods of activity. Basically, November, December, uh, early November, you see some peaks. We've seen it three years running. And then again, at the end of the produce season, April, May, June. So those are the two big peaks of activity that we typically see. But what's really interesting, what I was more concerned with, was what's going on during the produce season. 
And in, in, in particular, why do we see that very first initial peak um, at the beginning, you know, October, when they first started to show up? Uh, again, you can see some movement here, but they really start to pick up in November. Personally, I think a lot of that's got to do with, with the wind direction, the shift from the monsoon being over, and I think temperature has a lot to do with it. So what we did last year is we went out in, uh, what is that, 62 fields in the fall and the spring, and I would place these sticky cards, sticky traps, right on the edge of the lettuce field. Not in the lettuce field, they get wiped out by tractor blight. Same thing with melons. I thought, well, you know what? All those fall melons, um, we knew from some other studies that they do attract a high number of thrips. So I wanted to see during the course of a fall melon season if we see spikes in those traps given key cultural operations such as harvest, such as uh, disking that block over, under. Basically, this is the data. If you look at it, the, the orange line is fall melons. And most of those were out in, in Roll, a little bit in uh, Tacna, a little bit in Dome Valley. But this is where you go. You see this initial peak here. Um, and to me, and again, I, I'm, I'm speculating, but I think that a lot of that probably has to do with change in wind direction with the end of the monsoon at the end of September. And then we see the second peak um, about November. And to me, that's, you can go back and look at the individual fields, and you can see that a field was either being broken, harvested, or been dished under. So you see a lot of movement off those melons at that time. The green is the lettuce. The yellow is that area wide. Now the area wide, those traps are static. They're in the same place every year. So you never know if there's gonna be a, a lettuce field next to it or a cotton field or a melon. So you never know. The green right next to lettuce. And you can see the numbers are, are actually much greater than our area wide numbers. The trends are relatively the same but the numbers are different, and they kind of match up with what we saw in the melons. So melons probably have a big influence. The one thing I didn't do last year, which I will do this year, is have alfalfa on this line, have traps right next to alfalfa, because I do believe those contribute, particularly when those fields are cut, to this migration. The other interesting thing is, is temperature, as Daniel alluded to. You get out here in August and September, we know it's hot. It's in the 90s, average. Average here with this first peak or around that first time, it's an average of about 80 degrees. And that's, that's a, an average between the Roll Azimuth site and the Yuma Valley Azimuth site. So it's kind of variable. The second peak is at about 70 degrees. This is when we see this movement. It tends to be when the temperatures are about 70. Now, of course, in the winter, you can't see it because this is covering up. It's about 55 to 60 on average. Uh, temperatures, and then you get out here again with that late season peak, and it's about 70 degrees. So it seems to be like 70 degrees, along with many other factors that can contribute, seem to be um, ideal for flight. Now, I'm not saying it's the sole indicator of why they move in higher numbers, but it does tend to correlate with that, that particular temperature regime. The other thing we wanted to look at was what was actually on the plants. We wanted to get plant numbers themselves. So we actually went out, uh, did a bunch of 79 fields, 29 in the fall, 50 in the spring, and we looked at a number of different lettuce types, uh, two-line head, three-line romaine, six-line hearts, and then two-line, we had a couple fields that were mixed, green and red leaf. So we had a variety of different lettuce types, and what we do is we, we use a bee pen sample. Basically, you just cut the plant and you just whack it in a prescribed manner onto that yellow sticky card that's within or underneath that, that screening. We take those cards into the lab and we actually count what's there. To put it in perspective for you guys that watch alfalfa and cotton, it's much no different than, enough than a sweep net. You sweep for ligus. It doesn't tell you what's on the plant. You sweep for weevils. It doesn't tell you on a per plant basis, but it'll give you relative differences through time or before or after you spray. So it gives it a relative estimate through time or compared to do diff different fields in the same area. So it's a relative sampling method that we've used and been using it for years. So here's the plant samples, and this is the individual blocks, uh, the number of fields within an individual area, from Tacna down to the Yuma Valley. And you can see, same, very, very comparable to that peak in movement of adults on the yellow sticky cards here in November, and then again at the end of the produce season. Not surprising, and it'll show up again here real quick, is that the number one, or the hottest spots, 
our role in Dome Valley. I don't need to tell you guys, that seems like everything, all the insect pressure is always heavier, particularly in the Dome Valley area, but in here in Roll. And this could be in part due to there's a lot more melons grown out there as opposed to places in the Yuma Valley. So that's, that's the actual numbers um, averaged over all the fields on a, on a, on a, on a spe specific date weekly. This lower graph is the same time period, but it's averaged over all sampling sites. And what that shows you are the distribution of adults and larvae. Daniel talked about reproductive. Well, you can see that in these peak periods, those thrips are very reproductive. You see in some cases just as many adults as you do thrips. So it's not just a function of something moving in, it's a function, a function of these populations starting to colonize these plants. So we know, and we see this on, on just about every crop we sample. So that kind of gives me a snapshot of the density. But again, it's kind of like what Daniel was saying. You guys probably already knew this, but it's, it's kind of nice to, to validate it and, and actually have some numbers to support it. Again, the temperatures kind of match up. You get out here, it's still a little bit warm, but when you get into those 70 degrees, you know, 80, 80 max, 60 min, that seems to be, uh, you know, the temperatures that they really prefer. And even when it gets cold by our standards, you still see development. You still see reproduction and development. This is just a real fancy slide that shows every single field we sampled. The dark green bar is the fall melon, or excuse me, the fall lettuce crop. Spring lettuce is the, is the, uh, the light green. The reason I wanted to show this is just to say that places like Dome and Roll, yeah, they have some very high numbers. I don't think it's any surprise that we found more in the spring than we do in the fall. That's, that's just a given. Uh, places like Welton didn't have nearly as, as abundant as the others. But what's really interesting is that even within a spring crop, you see this wide range of variability from field to field. Each one of those bars represents an individual field. You see a lot of variability. This particular block here in Roll, that was one of Dan Fox's fields. And he, <laughs> I, I, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. And this one was Bill Fox's field. So no, I, 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 I kid, no, I, I, totally anonymous. But the point being is that there's a, lot of, there's a lot of variability and we don't know why. It could be management, could be intensity of sprays, could be the surrounding crops around you, could be a lot of different factors. But it's just interesting that it's not just real uniform. I'll tell you this though, these two blocks were the only, excuse me, this block and this block were the only two fields I walked into that looked like they had a lot of cosmetic injury. Most of everything else was very, very clean. And I think that's just a, a, a sign that there's a lot of good management going on this year. We'll see what it looks like this upcoming season, but those were some pretty clean fields when it came to the cosmetic injury, cosmetic injury that thrips cause. Okay, we also wanted to get a sense of what's in the surrounding land landscape. Uh, you know, this is a pretty diverse cropping system and it varies from location to location, but there's a, we have key crops that we know thrips go in and out of. And so to me, I thought, well, it'd be really interesting to know where these things are going both during the produce season as well as when the produce season is over. So we set a, a, a couple of, I did a study. It started actually this last April when INSB first showed up, we looked at uh, uh, the produce crops, we looked at most of the agronomic crops, the key agronomic crops, and then weeds. And we went to five locations every two weeks. And within a section of ground, we sampled those things essentially side by side to kind of get an idea of these relative differences between the host crops that are out there and what they may or may not be contributing uh, to the cropping system. Well, this is what we saw. Now, when you look at this graph, this is April of 21. This is last year, April. And I just took it all the way through. This was December, and here we are now, August. So don't get fooled by these two peaks because these two peaks represent this, essentially the same time period, that being late spring, April, May, June. Obviously, alfalfa is a driver. It seems to be a magnet for thrips, particularly when we get those warmer temperatures that time of the year. You'll note during the produce season, and I highlight lettuce, um, it still has fewer numbers than the alfalfa surrounding it. Uh, you'll note sedan grass, at some times that's the yellow one, at certain times of the season, particularly, again, May, June, it's, they seem to be pretty abundant. And I was kind of surprised. I didn't think sedan grass would be a, a good host for them, but they do. 
The other thing that I don't have data to show you today, much like what Daniel just showed you, is that every single one of these, these hosts have their reproductive populations. You capture both adults and larvae on all these plants just about every time you sample. So you know they're reproductive, they're, they're cycling through. This is just a table that shows two different time periods, basically the produce season and then the off season. And if you look at our produce crops, certainly lettuce is the driver. They love lettuce, which is interesting because it's not a flowering crop per se. The way we grow it, it's not a flowering crop, but they love it as opposed to the brassicas and, and celery. Again, March being the, the, key, the key period when it's there. If you look at the agronomic crops, again, there's no question, particularly in the off season, that Sudan and alfalfa are the drivers. And it seems to be, in just about every case, at the tail end of the season. And we all know what happens at the tail end of March and April, that biomagnification that occurs. The lettuce acres start going down pretty quickly. These strips just get and they start to migrate to the, whatever's green for the most part. And that seems to be when we're, we're seeing the, the mass abundance of, um, of thrips. This is weeds. We, did, we do uh, a number of weeds separately, and you can see that it's not a driver, but they're, again, May, and in this particular last, uh, last season, we saw them uh, February, March, and April. So you can see they're there, uh, and they're going to the weeds, um, but as Daniel, not Daniel, excuse me, Dan, Samuel is gonna talk to you here in a few minutes. Uh, weeds, weeds are, you know, they're not nearly as abundant as, as our other crops uh, that we grow. Nonetheless, you can see that when you can find a weed to sample, they're, they're, they're certainly there. And again, they seem to be that uh, late season phenomena. Goosefoot's the one, at least in my sampling, that seems to be there all the time. And when, it, when it's there, it seems like the thrips really like to go to Goosefoot. Certainly in the winter, London Rocket, and then Little Mal or Cheeseweed towards the end of the season, uh, back in May if it's, if it's still growing. So that just gives you an indication of the weeds that we sampled and the, way, the, the, the species that tend to attract or, or have the highest thrips abundance. Okay, now I'm gonna shift over. I've talked about thrips. So I think we're starting to understand thrips a little bit more, where they're going. A lot of it I think we all assumed, and now we have some support. Uh, what crops are going to and when they're abundant and why they're abundant, particularly in temperature. But let's talk about uh, INSV, some of the monitoring we've done. I showed this slide at this meeting last year. This was when it showed up uh, March 11th, started getting a lot of calls and we started running out east and trying to verify the fact that it was there, it was truly INSV. And this is what we came up with. Uh, basically, uh, no surprise that these these hot spots were, were near where transplants had been uh, propagated earlier in the fall. Nonetheless, overall, you can see that most of the, the fields that we that tested positive were less than 1% or less, which is nothing uh, when, you, when you look at it. Had a couple of hot spots other than that. My thoughts at that time were that, you know, as you're going to see from Daniel, there's, there's just not a lot of weeds out there, a lot of alternate hosts, if you will, for these strips to go to. So where, where's this virus been hiding out for all these years? Where's it been? The other thing was, is I've been doing research here at the Ag Center for 32 years, and the first time I ever saw this virus was 2021. And it's no coincidence that just that previous year, Salinas had a, a pretty big blowout. So at that point, I started to think, well, maybe this stuff's coming from the outside. And I started to think, well, we do bring transplants in. Certainly we bring brassica transplants in and we bring uh, lettuce transplants in. Some of them come from the coast. A lot of them are grown here locally. I think the ones that are grown here locally, they're no different than, than um, any commodity that's produced here. It's the, it's, the, it's the transplants that are coming from an infested area that I thought was, was something that we needed to look at. So what we did is we had permission to work with some shippers to look at some of the transplants that were coming in to the system, we actually would go into the, their nursery or their staging areas and just vacuum these trays with these high-powered vacuums, collecting them in these vials to see what was on the plant, what, what was actually coming in in terms of thrips. Um, this is the romaine transplants that we brought in. 
We basically, they're all coming from Salinas. We were doing about 40 to 80 trays by just sitting there and vacuuming like this. Uh, you can see there's some pretty good numbers uh, at any given point, particularly in, in early October. We were seeing some pretty good numbers coming in on these transplants. Then I would hand them off to Stephanie and Daniel, uh, Samuel, and they would actually do the ELISA and the um, amino strip test to detect whether they were positive for, for INSV. And in fact, you can see that seven out of those 10 um, vacuum sampling bouts that we ran, they were, they were positive. There were positive thrips coming off of those plants. So that, that was an indication that perhaps the stuff is coming from the outside, given all of the other factors that don't seem to contribute to the fact that we all of a sudden had this problem. We also did some brassica. You can see we had, didn't find nearly as many thrips or as many as infected thrips, but the fact is, is that they were, we did find them on two occasions. And why is that important? Because the brassicas aren't a reservoir or host for the virus, but if that thrip's infected and he jumps adjacent field next, next to it, um, it's a possibility he could infect some cl essentially clean lettuce. So we thought that was pretty important. Shortly thereafter, a couple weeks after we started doing this, we started getting calls, started getting guys sending me texts of infected plants, symptomatic plants in the field, and then they were sending me their INSV test kits, uh, immunostrip tests indicating that it was positive, and we would bring those back into the lab and see that yes, yes indeed, they were positive. Well, at that point, uh, point I got this great idea that I'm going to go out and pick up locations where I know that there is transplants being planted, whether largely romaine transplants, all the way from Tacna to Dome Valley. And so what we did, you can see here, the six blocks that are, or, or areas that I located, all of them but this one actually tested positive. The, there were plants in that block that tested positive in that. Um, then what we did, and so that would be the, uh, the green is negative. Did not test. We didn't see anything. We weren't able to collect anything to test. Well, what I, what I did thereafter was I kept following those blocks all year long, all the way into the spring, and just circling and looking at fields in the, in the surrounding areas for signs of infection. And indeed, we did find it. It seemed to be in points of infection around each area. Even the one that we, we didn't see the symptoms in the fall, we did find symptomatic plants in the spring. Um, Again, there was lettuce scattered throughout here that I did not check, but I wasn't getting any phone calls or any texts from anybody saying, hey, I, find it, I found it over on you know, County 24. I wasn't hearing that, so I just, keep in mind, this is focused on where we knew transplants had come in from the outside. We also did that in the Yuma Valley, down in the south, here in the north, this is actually right here by, right where we're at, Bard, and then in the, in the Gila Valley. And not as, not as widespread, not as many, with the exception of maybe that block in the South Yuma Valley, but that we never did see any positive symptomatic plants in these blocks here, but obviously it was there because it showed up a little bit later. So that's kind of where we were with tracking this. That doesn't say there wasn't virus in these other areas. We were just focused in these main areas. Now that's kind of misleading. If you look at this, you go, oh my God, it's viruses everywhere. But when you look at it, most of the blocks most of the blocks that I was walking around or checking in, they look like this. You'd see a plant here, maybe a plant there. This is a block that was out in Welton. This is one of Dan Fox's fields. Yeah. <laughs> you can see one, two, three, three romaine plants. Actually, when I estimated that field, it was at 1.1% infestation, and you can see they mowed it. So it wasn't like there was yield limiting INSV in these blocks. But this is what it looks like if you look at the, the frequency or the total. These, each, one of these each one of these bars represents an individual field. We looked at 234 fields in this whole area. You can see quite a few of them are zeros. You can see how a lot of them are less than one. When you look at it from a, 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 pers a different perspective, 85% of the fields that I was looking at were less than 1%. These 200 blocks were less than 1%. You, you know, you, you can't hardly see it unless you, if you're really looking for it. You can see about 10% were about here. This is about 10%. And then you've got, 
you've only got uh, five percent of those whole blocks that had more than three percent. And I'll tell you right now, this I should have thrown this one out. Number eight, it's about eight and a half percent. This one bar, <laughs> that was a romaine seed crop that was in the Gila Valley in May, completely out of the growing window, but it was it was there. So again, it's you can see that that's kind of an outlier. But the bottom line is that's not that's not like what Tony just described or what we hear from Daniel about what's going on in Salinas. So it really leads me to this question. How big of a threat is INSV in the desert? You know? Based on what we're seeing, I think based on what Daniel is going to tell you, based on what, what I've observed over the last two uh, tail end of the growing seasons, I would say it's going to be low to moderate. But having said that, I said, I said that same thing to some PCAs in Salinas last winter, and they just laughed at me. And they go, you know, that's what we said 12 years ago when this thing first showed up. Again, different cropping systems. We have a completely different environment. Uh, based on what we're seeing now, it doesn't look like it's a huge threat, indigenous, if you will, or incipient threat. Seems like it's coming from the outside. But again, don't, don't listen to me, because you just never know. <laughs> you just never know. This stuff could sneak up and, and find a host and just uh, 10 years from now, just be like Salinas. Deep down inside, I don't think so, but you never know. You never know. So with that, I think it's real critical that you guys really continue to ma maintain your aggressive insecticidal control programs. You, you almost already have to for cosmetic injury and the quality standards that you're, you're held to, but even more so now that particularly when you get into the spring and that later spring, uh, just to keep those populations from... from uh, cycling through in the plant and that secondary spread that can really, really cause some problems. So let me talk about thrips control with insecticide. And I've, I've, I'll show you this slide. This is the same slide I show at just about every single meeting. It doesn't change much. Uh, basically, I've got these four highlighted in blue. That's really the products of choice, the products that year in and year out, test by test, perf really provide performance. You'll note that I have Torac here in a mid-green, lime green. The reason that is is that it's really dependent on plant size. When you've got a small open plant because it's primarily through contact activity, you get great control, both adult and larvae. Once the plant gets any big size to it, you start to lose that. You don't get that residual control that you do when the plant's smaller. But other than that, to me, they, they, these are the big four. These others, suppression at best. Do they have a fit? We talked about that last year. Sure they do, but you know, maybe more when you've got another problem going on. But what I want to talk to you this afternoon about is some things that we've been doing most recently. But first, let me start with this. You know, Radiant and Lanate, there's the four I just mentioned. And this is a pretty consistent, these are the lettuce insect loss data that you guys generate for us every year. And you'll see that Radiant and Lanate, it's about, you know, for every two Radiants, there's a, there's a single Lanate. And it's about 50 to 60% of the acres as opposed to about 100% of the acres. So I don't think it's a surprise. You see some acetate on head lettuce if you've got the time. Torac, I think people are starting to feel a little more comfortable with it. Bottom line is, with all this pressure we've been putting on these two products for the last, um, what is that, 18 years, you'd think that maybe those, the, the efficacy would be slipping. Well, in fact, it hasn't been slipping. We've been, we've been uh, tracking efficacy with both Lanate and the Spinosins initially with success and then more recently with, with uh, Radiant in these small plot trials. And what you're seeing is, is field efficacy. This isn't laboratory. This is actually field efficacy. You can see it's not, it's not changing. We're not seeing any massive fluctuations. This is the larvae. If you look at adults, that line goes down to about 60, uh, maybe 60 percent, but you still don't see a lot of massive change in the efficacy. And so we're sustaining, you are sustaining efficacy in part be, by following the labels, rotational, and in part because of the cropping system. What happens at the end of the produce system? They go to alfalfa, they go to wheat, they go to, they go to all these crops that aren't treated with either of these two products. And so you're pulling the selection pressure for who knows how many generations off, off of, the, off of that, uh, those populations of western flower thrips. But let's talk about the new stuff, the new work. This is where I think it's kind of exciting. Um, talk about some soil systemics, uh, insecticides. My thought for looking specifically at soil systemics 
was primarily because, you know, it's like any virus. We see it with the yellows virus on cucurbits. The longer you can delay the transmission, the better chance you have to making it to market. If you can delay that, delay that uh, transmission, you can delay the infection, and if you delay it long enough, you're not going to take a hit. Same thing with, with lettuce. Uh, and if you're, that plant's popping out of the ground and it's getting a load with an insecticide, an effective insecticide, well, perhaps you can delay it, and maybe if you augment it with foliage, you can do a pretty good job. This is probably has more bearing for the Salinas guys than it does for us, because they, they tend to come in later. Admire Pro, that's the standard. Everybody uses it for white flight control, for aphid control. We used to see a little bit of activity back in the day at that, remember the old 2F, 16 ounces of the 2F was a quarter pound AI. Now, all the generics in Admire Pro, everybody's going top of the label, which is 0.375. I thought, well, let's go back and visit it and see if that higher rate that everybody's using cost effectively, maybe it's got some kick to it. Belay, for those of you that don't remember Belay, it was a cotton, mainly a cotton product. A lot of guys would use it for stink bugs and even some white flies. It's got a soil label. It's a neonicotinoid, just like in Meyer Pro. And then Belief, um, the FMC people approach me and they're trying to get a SLN for Belief at this high rate as a drip label in the soil. So I thought, hey, well, and we know it's got systemic activity, but the question is how much and how much will it will do? Because as a foliar, all it will do is provide suppression of thrip. And then finally, Veramark, which is a very effective diamide. Um, again, as a foliar, the x comparison, that would be x it provides basically suppression of thrips. But I was really curious to see what Veramark would do. So we looked at these different types of systemics in, in three different trials. One of them was we looked at Nipset seed treatment, which is basically uh, clothianidin, which is the same active ingredient that's found in Belay. We looked at at plant soil injection, basically just at planting shank injection of at planting, and then we actually played around with drip chemigation. Let me show you the first, the first group. This is uh, the Nipset. Um, again, clothianidin, Plant it on the seed, pretty straightforward, right? No difference, no difference, no difference. We didn't see any differences. And this is, 30, this is an average over a 30-day sample window. We were real curious at 7 and 14 days, as that plant was like at the two-leaf stage, maybe the three or four-leaf stage. Again, no differences. And again, to me, you, just, you, just, you can only load so much insecticide on a seed. And I think that's, it's great, works great on flea beetle, works great on bagrata bug, but it does not seem to have what I would consider good thrips activity. So that would be the Nipset. We tried that. We tried a couple of the previous year too and saw essentially the same results. So I don't think Nipset's got a fit. Now this is the shank injection. This is a typical shanking it an inch and a half below the seed line, incorporating it when you're German with your germ water. This is an interesting trial because we had all four, five of the, four of those treatments and at the four leaf stage, which could be depending on the wet date, anywhere from 24 to 30 days after we hit, after wet date, you can see that the Veramark actually had re significantly reduced numbers of, of larvae. Now this is larvae, keep that in mind. This is the significantly reduced numbers of larvae. Once you get beyond the four leaf, you get to the eight leaf, the 12 leaf, it loses it. All of a sudden, everything's equal. But initially, right up front, when that plant's pretty susceptible, it looks like it's got some, some significant impact, particularly here under higher numbers. Now, having said that, we saw absolutely no effect on the adults. And it's hard to measure adults sometimes in these trials because they tend to move in and out. So what this would suggest to me is that perhaps it may have some impact on the immatures, maybe that secondary spread as they acquire virus potentially and move it on. But certainly you're not going to stop, at least based on these three trials, you're likely not going to stop any primary infection coming from the outside. Uh, again, if you could augment it with foliars, perhaps, but uh, I don't know how cost effective that really is. So anyway, I thought that was pretty interesting. We did the same thing with the, uh, with the drip chemigation. In this trial, we came in at the three leaf stage made our first chemigation. We came back again at the eight to 10 leaf stage, made a second chemigation. And you can see that, again, the Veramark was, was actually significantly reduced, but 
that's about, that's basically suppression is what that is. That's not control. And these, again, these are the larvae, and there was no control of the adults. So basically, in this type of scenario, these soil systemics may or may not play a fit. Unfortunately, we didn't have a chance to really measure INSV. We did have a little bit of INSV in these trials, but we never saw high enough numbers to really gauge if there were true treatment differences out there. Salinas might be a different story. You guys might, if you're not already doing it, I'm sure somebody's doing it, you may actually see something, particularly if you're augmenting it with something like Lanate or, or Radian. So that's basically the soil work that we were focused on. Not uh, real encouraged, but we're going to still continue to play around with Verimark. Um, we, may, we may put it in, um, in, in germ water in, in lettuce in, in the winter, or excuse me, that, that, those December planting windows. So I have one last, one last group, and I think you'll find this one a lot more better. <laughs> no, more better, yeah. <laughs> a lot, lot more better. A lot, a, lot be a lot better than these previous slides. Some of you, you know, we had these trials, we've been running these trials for, for three years now. Seven total trials, um, six of them in the fall, uh, spring, one of them in the fall. And what we've been looking at is this new compound, and these are all foliar spray trials called planazolin. It's a product that Syngenta's been working on for, I, I think I've been working on it for five or six years. I don't know how long they've, it's been in development, probably 10. But it just was recently submitted to the EPA for registration last uh, January. And they've released, I, I wasn't able to talk about it until just this spring. They've released, they pulled Confidential off. So now we can talk about it. But basically they're calling it planazolin <coughs> technology. The actual active ingredient is isocycle serum. Um, it's also ICM555. That's kind of what I've been playing with for the last few years. What's great about this compound, it's a re unique mode of action. It's not like anything else you're out there. It's not a, it's not a spinosin. It's not an imidacloprid. It's not a neonicotinoid. It's its own IRAC group 30. I'm not going to describe the mode of action, but trust me, it's different. This is what's really interesting about it. It's a foliar contact activity. It's not translaminar like radian is. It's more like lanate in the fact that it's, it's primarily active through contact activity, um, which to me, I always thought, oh, you're better off being translaminar. It's got reduced risk status, so that kind of gives you an indication of its fit in IPM programs. And the other good news, probably more good news for us also, is that it's got activity on armyworm, looper, and for you guys over on the coast, it's got activity on diamondback moth at low rates. And I, I'm not going to show you that data, but it's the real deal on, on, on diamondback. But, so it's got a fit. It, it's almost like a contact radiant. It's going to behave a lot like radiant on thrips and leps. So that's what we've been looking at. So let me share some data with you real quickly, just a, a, a summary. This is percent adult control. Um, the, the blue bar is three days after application, foliar, and seven days. And this is an average of seven, seven trials, one to two sprays per trial, blah, blah, blah. Well, you'll note that the three days, um, it was almost 80% control, as opposed to about 60%, 62 or three, with the lanate and radiant. Now, those products aren't really known to be adult killers, if you will. Adult activity, that's about, about normal for um, both lanate and radiant. In fact, this one was almost 20% higher mortality, or in this, in this case, control. This is percent control as opposed to radiant. Not, not significantly different than lanate. So that's pretty impressive. All of a sudden, now we have a product that will come in and provide as good of adult control if not better than our industry standards. When you look at the immature stages, it's almost a push. It's, it's equally as good, about 80% across the board on the larvae as it is against, um, uh, again, with the industry standards. So all of a sudden, uh, assuming, I mean, it's been submitted, uh, Syngenta is very, very optimistic that it's not going to hit. In fact, I think California has actually placed it on their expedited review list. Uh, which, is, when CDPR does that, that's a pretty good sign that it's a pretty good compound, or pretty safe anyway. Um, so what's, what does that mean in the, in the scheme of things? Well, if you were to lose ra ra lanate, or you as a shipper or grower choose not to use lanate, you've got an alternative down, coming down the road. If lanate is still around, and it's still a very, very uh, effective product, now you've got three products with which to rotate with and to control thrips as well as trash bugs, leps, et cetera. 
So with that, that's all I have. I probably told you too much, but uh, if you have any questions, be glad to, to answer them. Okay, our next speaker is, uh, is Samuel Disqua Duarte, who's a postdoctoral research associate here at the UMAG Center. He's associated with, uh, with my, my lab and with Stephanie's lab and he with the Department of Entomology also. He's going to, um, he's going to give you a presentation on I INSV uh, host weed survey that he's been conducting over the last, uh, well, he started about the middle of summer last year, so a full year. Let's go ahead and get started. So, um, uh, John introduced me. Uh, I'll be talking about INSV weeds. So we started, uh, John and Stephanie started surveying weeds here in the desert uh, around March last year. So I'll be giving you an update. Uh, Stephanie talked about this a little bit last year. We have uh, more data now to present. So um, as you heard from the previous speakers, INSV uh, has a wide range of hosts and uh, weeds can play a role in transmitting the virus. So if we are going to have and uh, provide any recommendation, uh, recommendation any, any recommendations for control or reducing the amount of virus, weed control certainly will play a role in that. Um, you've heard from uh, Dr. Hasegawa um, about the research that he's doing uh, with weeds, identifying the weed hosts, and uh, we're trying to do um, the same thing here in Arizona, right? We want to understand what happens. In our case, it will be around April and May uh, when that last produce is finishing up and you have that uh, latest weed transmission and also when the produce season is getting started, what's going on with the weeds in terms of uh, infection rates with, with INSV. So we want to determine what are the primary hosts, uh, what are the, the weeds that we should be most concerned about as far as INSV infection rates, and also we want to know if can the virus really survive uh, in the summer uh, here in, in, in Arizona? Are we facing a similar problem as, as they are in Salinas? So as I mentioned, this survey started in 2021 around March when uh, Stephanie and John started hearing reports from PCAs uh, that there was virus underground. Um, so we have about, we've been collecting in about 100 different locations uh, from Tacna to San Luis, Somerton area. We have been collecting more or less um, every week, both uh, weeds and thrips. The thrips we have been collecting from, from the weeds themselves. So we've been using, um, as, as John mentioned in his presentation, we've been using a vacuum sample. We've been vacuuming the weeds to collect the, the, the thrips from the weeds and getting them tested. So we selected the sites uh, based on INSV incidents, both what, whenever we saw plants infected on the fields and also uh, based on what happened last year. The fields that had more infection last year, we, we also revisited those sites to see what um, if there were still any, any, any virus around in those fields from last year. Also, uh, we, we, we kind of focused on the outside edges of the field and on uncultivated areas, on the non-cropped areas. Uh, we did not go much into the fields until they were harvested. So at, right after harvest, then I would go in and, and, and collect some weeds from those fields to see if those weeds inside the fields got um, infected with INSV. So we had a, a lettuce plant with INSV and then I would collect a weed if there was a weed not right next to it to see if it was infected with INSV. Um, and then for testing, uh, we use the same methods as uh, Dr. Hasegawa is doing. So we use an antibody test, it's called an ELISA test. Um, and then we use the immunostrips for confirmation. So um, most of you are familiar with the immunostrips. I know um, Junior Evans from Corteva, he gave uh, immunostrips to a lot of the PCAs uh, last year early in the season, and then we're gonna be giving out some today as well. Uh, and if you haven't used them, we'll be also doing a demo uh, on how to use uh, immunostrips. Um, in some cases, we also did PCR as a third method of confirmation. Uh, in some weeks that we had um, results were, uh, were inconclusive, like we had one positive, in the ELISA, but it came negative in the PCR, so we wanted to have like a third method to make sure that we had, um, we had the accurate results. And uh, we did this both for the weeds and also for the thrips. So, so far, we have collected over 7,000 weeds 
in two years. So that's, that's more than Daniel already um, in Salinas. So we collected about 3,000, 2021, 4,000 this year so far. And the numbers are low in comparison to Salinas. Um, we have only got 74 positive weeds from 7,000. So that's about a 1% infection rate of all the weeds, which it kind of correlates to uh, what John just presented about uh, the insect loss survey and the amount of INSV that was seen in the, in, in the lettuce fields. Um, that represents over 50 different weed species, and we collected more than 1,000 uh, thrips from the weed vacuum samples. We also focused our collections, uh, our, our weed collections, a lot at the start of the produce season and also right at the end of the produce season. So this chart right here, it shows how many weeds we collected by month and year. So yellow would be this year and blue is uh, last year, 2021. And then the other y-axis represents the positivity rate. So out of the weeds that we collected, what percentage of those weeds tested positive with INSV? So if we collected, or if we have a 10% a, a positivity rate, that would mean that 10 plants out of 100 tested positive for INSV. So what you can see here, one of the trends is that in April, we had the peak infection rates. That's where we found the peak of INSV in last year and also this year, which correlates a little bit with what John just said uh, about the abundance of thrips, right? When the, when the numbers of thrips start picking up and also when a lot of the produce is getting harvested or, or the, the last produce is getting harvested and then uh, the thrips probably moving to other crops and also the weeds. Then another thing that was very interesting is that look at what happened at the start of the produce season, both in 2021 and uh, 2022, we found no positive weeds on, um, no, no INSV positive weeds in those months when the produce season started. We found, um, and, and you can see that we collected very heavily um, in August and September last year. Um, this year, I, we're still ongoing. I still don't have all the data for this, for this month, but um, we haven't found any positive weeds so far this month, this year. So we, last year, we did not find any, any positive INSV weeds in the field since late June. And this year, we haven't found any positive INSV weeds since uh, late July. Uh, we hope it stays that way uh, this year uh, in August. And so far, for the past two weeks, um, we haven't found any positive weeds. Um, also, notice that we didn't sample very much in November and December because we had different objectives when we survey started. Uh, originally, we just wanted to know what was happening at the beginning of the season, but then we decided that it was also interesting to look at when do those weeds start becoming infected and whether weeds would play any role in becoming a, a, a source of a virus uh, and, and transmit it to, to other fields, like a, like a bridge in between plantings. Uh, when you, you harvest that first, uh, November, December planting, and then if, if there's any other lettuce being planted in, in January, would those weeds be a bridge to help infect some of those um, additional plantings? So the first positive weeds that we found came in, in January this year. From July um, or late June last year, we did not find any positive weeds until early January. That was the first INSV positive weeds that we found was in early January. And then, as I said, um, we first detected INSV in January. Then we saw the peak in both years as far as how many of those weeds were infected in, in April. So about a 10% infection rate and a 3.6% uh, infection rate uh, this year. So last year, 10%, this year, 3.6%. And we did not see any INSV um, in those first months of the produce season. So in overall, 
uh, it's, it's a percentage for the 2020 produce season, 2020, 2021 produce season, about 3.4 percent and less than 1 percent positivity rate for this year. So we found some positive weeds. So these are the, the 13 weeds, the 13 positive weeds that we found from our surveys. And you'll see that some of them um, are very widespread, very common. So the first three, I would say those are the most important ones in terms of both numbers and how many of them were infected. So goosefoot was number one, followed by purslane and lamb's quarters. And goosefoot and lamb's quarters, those are more cool season weeds as compared to with purslane, which purslane, you, you don't expect to see very much purslane in December, January, but um, goosefoots would be the, the most dominant weeds at that time of the year. And then um, tumble amaranth, ground cherry, uh, there's horse purslane. Uh, these again are, are more warm season um, weeds uh, that, are, that you would see right now in the fields. Then this other seven, I would say, are not as important because we did not find in the same numbers as the other ones. Uh, but south thistle, um, cheeseweed, or um, mustards. Um, this one, lesser seaspray, is a weed that I didn't even know existed until we started this project. And there's only like a few pockets of it in Tacna and Welton that you would see. And, and we would find actually, in terms of percentage-wise, that there was relatively more INSV as, as, a, as a proportion, as a, as a percent of infected plants of this weed than a lot of the other ones I mentioned. Then the last three, uh, we only collected a handful of them. So we don't really have a lot of data to really say if they're actually uh, something that you would be, need to be concerned or not. And you can see that there's a lot of overlap to what uh, Daniel has said in Salinas. Like these weeds, uh, almost all of them also occur in Salinas. So um, nothing, nothing surprising there. So here's the, the total number of weeds that we collected and then the positivity rates. What percentage of those weeds tested positive for INSV? So as I mentioned, goosefoot, it's the most abundant and widespread uh, weed species that we saw. It only got a positivity rate of about 2%. Uh, purslane, even lower, uh, even though it's, it's a very common weed, even lower, it's like a half a percent, so only a handful of, of uh, purslane tested positive. Same with lamb's quarters. So these three will be the, the most dominant ones. Then tumbleweed amaranth, we found a couple of them uh, that tested positive ground cherry, this is her first lane. And then you can see some of these that were collected in lesser numbers had actually somewhat higher positivity rates. But then we're talking about very small numbers. You cannot even see the, the, the line because of the scale of this graph for the sweet yellow clover because we only collected less than 10. So 30% of them, but it's, it was like three, three weeds. So it really, um, it's, it's a little bit misleading uh, in the sense that there's not really um, this might not be as important as, as the first three. So for the top 10 weeds, we had at least 60 specimens that we collected, 60 different weeds, and then um, only a handful of them uh, testing positive. So, and also, uh, just to emphasize, in both years, we, only, we collected positives only for these four weeds. So goosefoot, purslane, lamb's quarters, and south thistle. So now let's talk about thrips. So for the thrip samples, I wasn't interested in, in uh, testing every individual thrips for INSV, but what I did instead is that I, I tested them in bulk. So if I collected 20 or 30 thrips from weeds in a single, in, in one sample, I would test them all uh, in, the same, in the same sample. I would not test them individually because I wasn't interested in knowing what percentage of weeds uh, of thrips were infected. I just wanted to know if INSV was present or not in those samples. So I had about um, 175 samples in here from February uh, through November. And what you can see here is that the numbers um, of positive thrips and also positive and the numbers of thrips peaked in April. Similar to what you saw with John uh, in the previous talk, the numbers um, somewhat correlate, even though we had different sampling methods. He was using uh, the sticky traps, he was using the, the, the bead pan method with the sticky traps, and I was using uh, 
I was vacuuming them individually from the weeds, we saw somewhat similar patterns. And uh, I did not find any more positive thrips in the weeds. I did find in some, in some lettuce, and that field that uh, John mentioned, that, that lettuce for seed field, I found some positive thrips in there, but I did not find any, any in, in the lettuce, but I did not find any positive thrips in the weeds. So this is only from the weeds that I collected. Um, one thing that's interesting though, is that last year, at uh, the very beginning of the season, I did find some positive thrips in Goosewood, and that was in an alfalfa field. And I went there and I sampled every week, trying to find any more, and I could not find any more thrips. So it could be that um, we missed some thrips, like every now and then there could be one that, that made it through the summer, or that there were, there were some weeds that were infected with INSV, but the numbers are just low, very low, especially if you compare that with Salinas. And uh, this is no surprise for anybody, so the, the weed abundance declines as we get into the summer. So here's an example of uh, how we did, uh, uh, or how we approached to our, our sampling. So this is a field that had INSV. This is after harvest. We sampled it. We sampled weeds inside the field, trying to find any positive INSV weeds. We did not find any. We knew and we sampled thrips and we, got, we collected positive thrips and positive lettuce, but we did not find anything. Then after disking one week, all that lettuce was gone. There was a little bit of um, regrowth in some of the ones that didn't get dissed all the way and we tested some of those and they were testing positive. Still, even, even after disking, like the ones that made it, that kind of survived, they were still testing positive. But we did not find any weeds that tested positive. Then, until April, a couple of months later, around the canal on, on, on that field, we found a couple of goosewood plants that tested positive for INSV. And we also collected thrips that tested positive for INSV in, that, in, that, in, in those same plants. Then, if you, on the other side of the canal, you can see that there, there's the wheat right there. We collected some of the wheat from that field, some, some of, the, some of the, the goosefoot along the edge of that wheat field, and we found some positive goosefoot in there. But then, once that wheat got, got harvested, we found not, no more positive weeds in there. And we did not find, like, the next week, so it will be like the, the, the May 24th, we found no more positive weeds, and we haven't found anything since. So, again, the message here is, there is very low incidence of INSV in the weeds and the thrips right now in the desert. Could that change? Uh, probably, uh, it depends. Um, I think we have a very different cropping system and also that the weather, the temperature swings here in the desert is just a different story from Salinas. So we hope it will stay, it will stay that way. Um, and again, if you look at incidents, we only have 70 weeds that we found positive. That's what Daniel gets in, for just one weed species for one season, he would get over 100 um, little mallow positive for INSV. Um, the number of thrips and the incidence of INSV, it peaked in April, and then from there it just de it declined. So, so far, from what we're seeing so far, weeds may not play a big role, um, they may not help the virus survive because of all the changes that we have in the, in the phenology of the weeds, they get replaced. But still, um, it's still a, a good idea to just make sure that those canals, those field margins get cleaned for any weeds because other insect pests and other um, diseases might be, in, might be harbored in, in those weeds. So what we're gonna do uh, in the future uh, we're still continuing with this survey. Uh, we got funded with a small block, uh, a specialty crop block grant from the USDA, so we have money for another year to continue with this survey. And this year we're going to focus more heavily on sampling more thrips. We're going to be collecting more thrips from the weeds, trying to get more, um, try to detect uh, when those thrips start moving to the, to the weeds and w when are the earliest that you would find any, any positive uh, weeds. And also this, uh, uh, some of these uh, results also complement really well with some of the transmission studies to determine uh, really what 
thrips really like, and also if, if, if some of these hosts are really good at um, infecting thrips so they can infect the, the lettuce again. And with that, um, thank you so much for your attention and also the people that helped us and the funding agencies. And, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. I'm Stephanie Slinsky. I'm the Associate Director of Applied Research and Development at the Yuma Center of Excellence for Desert Agriculture. And if anybody can repeat that back to me, I'll give them some, I don't know, give you one of John's hats. I'll steal one from him. <laughs> Um, I am working with, uh, on a lot of these INSV projects and I also am working on a project right now with uh, John Palumbo and Steve Kowicki where we are putting together our first report of Pythium Wilt. And yes, this is an INSV workshop, but Pythium wilt has become a huge problem in California um, to get, hey, you're showing my video. I might as well move ahead so you can see my video. Um, it's become a big problem in California and it has been popping up here and I just want you to be aware that it, it is in Arizona and it is, we are seeing it with INSV and I just want you to know how to detect it in your field. So I, um, Pythium wilt is caused by Pythium and Simulatum. This is a water mold or an oomycete. They can survive for long, a long time in the soil as oospores, and that's this top here. And they actually have these really cool oospores that have spines on them. Um, they're very tiny. This is in a, a root, this top picture. Um, and then when um, they are... The, when the oospores are um, stimulated by the roots, they will grow mycelium and they'll grow these sporangia that are these vesicles in which these oospores form and then they're, they're, rele they're released and they will swim in water. They'll go with water flow, they'll spread through your field. So this is not to scale, but um, this is, you can see the sporangia germinating there and releasing lots of zoospores. And it's on a loop, it doesn't refill. Okay, so Pythium wilt's been around for quite a while. It was described in the 70s in um, the Netherlands and it was described in Japan, but it was first found, described in California in 1995. Um, it doesn't cause any other disease or it hasn't been found to cause any other, uh, any disease on any other crops only lettuce and um, over the past few years, as Tony can probably tell you, it's become a huge problem. Um, so it seems to appear in warmer weather and INSV, there's debate about is INSV making Pythium worse? Um, Pythium is seen on its own in California, um, but it seems it, the combination does seem to make the disease worse. And it's also in combination with fusarium well and verticillium and sclerotinia. So there's a lot of factors c combined to, to make this uh, a problem. Oh, okay. So the symptoms are what you see for a lot of root rot. So stunting, wilting, you see yellowing of the outer leaves. Um, they might turn, they'll turn brown and collapse and sometimes you'll see this small upright green section in the middle and that that's, seems to be a good indicator that it's Pythium. It seems to be characteristic of Pythium in California at least. This isn't a really good example of that because you don't see that small um, upright section but I'll show you some more pictures. So one way to tell that this is Pythium and not Sclerotinia or Botrytis is that that crown stays intact, at least until the plant is entirely collapsed. So you won't have that easy separation of the top from the roots. And you won't have that visible mycelium like you do with um, sclerotinia or botrytis. And because you'll be seeing this around the same time as sclerotinia and botrytis, it's really important to be able to, well, I don't know if it's really important to tell the difference because it's a dead plant and um, <laughs> you'll, you'll 
we only see it in combination with INSV here right now, so you know it's up to you how important it is to distinguish. Okay, just some more pictures. This is from California. Steve Quick, you sent me these pictures. So I like how you can see the different stages of disease here. So you see the, the smaller stunted plants and, um, oops, I don't know how to use this thing. And you see the, the green, the upright section in the middle, and then you see some larger plants that weren't so stunted, but you might, you know, you see the, the browning leaves on the, the ends, the outside. Um, I took this picture, but I think I took this picture in California. I, I like it because you can see INSV, um, hope, can't see anything. Okay, so you can see some plants with INSV here, and some, and then you have some with Pythium. I don't know if these have INSV and Pythium or just Pythium alone, but this is a field with, you often see it in combination with INSV. Okay, so below ground symptoms, you don't have that rotted crown unless the plant is totally collapsed, but you will see this, this black root. You might see vascular discoloration if you have fusarium and the pythium, but you, you, if you only have the pythium alone, it'll be a more rotted root. You also see the rotted fine roots so that, um, you know, if you're looking at the fine roots, they pull apart and you'll just have that hair of the vascular tissue. So um, it's, it's rotting from, from the outside. You also might have, um, you also might do a cross section of the root and see that there's just, it's just a section where the root, where the fine hair came in. So you have a brown, brown sections on the side of the roots, but not banding. Here's just some more pictures. The blackened roots are a good indication. So um, sometimes it has those, those darker symptoms um, and you know more typical root rot symptoms and not the vascular. Okay, so my experience with Pythium in Arizona is that I have been seeing it in the past few years, and I have been sending samples to Steve Kowicki to confirm that we do have this. Um, I've, I've, you see it more widespread in fields that have more INSV. Um, I did look in the literature to see more, see if there's a history of this, of this, um, this pathogen in Arizona. And this is from 19, it's covered up, I think it's 1978, no, 19, 1987, 86, close. Okay, and this is um, from a researcher from the University of Arizona. He moved to Riverside afterwards, but he did this work in Arizona, and he detected Pythium uncinulatum on roots of field lettuce but it was asymptomatic. So he was just trying to see what pythiums were out there. So there was no disease in this case. So there was no, um, no report of lettuce disease caused by fusarium, or sorry, I always think about fusarium, pythium uncinulatum um, in Arizona before INSV. I first detected pythium in a root in 2019, but I had seen this in one of my, this is my fusarium wilt trial. I saw this in a root and I thought it was verticillium, so I sent it to Steve Kowicki. Steve Kowicki said, no, that's just, there's just some, some pigmentation in the root, but I got Pythium uncinulatum off of the roots there. So it's, can be found associated with roots. I don't know how widespread it is. I haven't done any kind of soil assays. I just know that we can find it associated with roots. It could be all over the place in, um, in Yuma. I don't, I don't know. Okay, in March 2021, that's when this picture is from. This is the field that I first saw INSV in. And I went back and I grabbed some of these plants 
the, the ones that were collapsed and didn't have those typical symptoms of INSV, and I sent them to Steve Kuicki, and he confirmed that they were um, Pythium and Sinulatum. This past year, I just decided, oh, it's time to go look for Pythium again, so I went out, first field I went to that had INSV, I found this plant, and then you know, any other field that you go around, around March, around spring, you could probably find this in just about every field. Um, I asked John to help me collect plants to send to Steve Kuicki, and he came back with loads of plants for me. And um, I sent them off to Steve, and he has confirmed Pythium on many of those samples. So, um, one of the things that we found is we don't have Pythium without INSV. All of the plants that are positive for Pythium and Sinulatum, um, or for, the, for Pythium wilt, have INSV. We have had some healthy plants that have, have it associated with the roots, but the, it doesn't have Pythium wilt. So it seems like in Arizona they have to go together, at least for now. Um, I have uh, found most of these plants in waterlogged fields or, you know, just it, fields that are being watered. So I don't know if that's a factor or if it's just you're watering that time of year. It's warming up. Um, it, so it, it, it could be the warmer temperatures. Uh, it could be that that's when you're seeing INSV. There's a lot we don't know. Um, I don't know what the distribution is in the field. I don't know if it's uniformly distri distributed in the field. I'm sorry I'm giving you a lot of I don't knows. But of the fields that we've seen, they've had about 1% INSV, and we're only seeing Pythium in about 1% of those plants. And those are plants with INSV already, so they likely wouldn't be harvested anyway. Um, you might, you might see more of this the more INSV you see. You're likely going to see it in the spring. Um, I have a lot of questions, but because it doesn't seem to be a severe problem, I wouldn't worry too much about it right now, but just know that's what you're looking at in your field. And if you are starting to see it becoming more of a problem, let us know and we'll try to figure out um, what to do about it. So you're probably not thinking about control strategies because it's not much of a problem right now, but um, there have been some studies done in California looking at fungicides and biologicals. They seem to have some effect, but there hasn't been a standout treatment yet. Um, Ritamil Gold has a, has a I don't know if it's the best performer. It seems to be performing pretty consistently. Um, but resistant varieties are the best control method right now. So if, in the future, if you do start having a problem with this, you need to talk to your seed supplier or find a variety that will have some resistant. Control in Arizona right now is basically prevent INSB and track, I mean, tracking incidence is not really a control, but um, track it, keep an eye on it, keep us informed, and um, hopefully we'll never get any further than just informing you about how to diagnose it in the field. Just want to mention that um, there's this great blog that um, UCANR has, and they have um, I know Daniel's written some articles for them. Um, everyone doing all this work in, Ca in California, um, they write these articles and they put up um, results of their trials and uh, it's a great place to find some information. And that was it. Does anyone have any questions? No? Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions for any of the other speakers? This is some time that we set aside to have a discussion if anyone wants to discuss anything. <laughs> I have a demo coming up if nobody has any questions, but please. Yes? 
what? Um, so can we make the assumption or the leap that the ISB is not over summer, over summering, over over summering? Is it being killed? I mean, the thrip the thrip are not dying. The thrip are there. What what is going on? I guess I don't know who would who would address that. Something something is dying in. June, July, and August, and it's not there again. Is, is that is that correct? Is that why we don't have it? I guess is my. I mean, that's that's makes the most sense. I mean, we're seeing the the hosts die out, and John shown that the the thrips the thrips population is is very low. So unless those thrips are surviving, you know, in the natural environment somewhere it's it seems like they're yeah it, it seems like we are having that disease-free period you know Bill pointed out that transmission that she was doing she wasn't finding out how about but she wasn't finding out how and I think Bellum's was the other one so you just get sports dirt out there right now and there's no weeds on the display department but Daniel pointed out you know, there's just some, there's some, it, it may be out there, but it's got to be a very small frequency, it seems like. Well, the first time you're seeing it, it's in the transplant. That, it, it sure seems like it, doesn't it? It sure seems like it. Can a, can a weed host be made for the summer? Say that again? Can a host weed be made for the summer? Can you test and find a positive weed that possibly be made for the summer? Oh, yeah. That's a good question. Can we keep those? Well, what are you saying? Is the weed alive or the INSV alive? I'm saying if the INSV is present, could you keep that weed alive for the summer and let it disappear? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, there's purslane all summer long, and you can find purslane everywhere. So, and it, it is it is a host, right? Purslane's a host. So, are we making the assumption that the INSV dies with the heat? It kills you. I don't. I don't make that assumption. You don't. Know, how could you not? What do you? What, what? How could you not? Based on what Daniel has, has shown, and based on what we've seen in the numbers, it's just as it, the thrips and the weeds are at such low densities that it's kind of like that needle in the haystack thing. It may be out there at a very low density, but to find it could be very, very difficult. And the, the, how could you have a weed in a day, Richard, that survives somewhere in that environment through the summertime? It's infected in the spring. It makes it all the way through. How could that not exist? Well, so it's possible. Not... It's possible. Mm -hmm. I'm probably, we, we just haven't found it. The, the, the weeds, because the numbers are just low. You saw in the lettuce, the numbers of, of infected groups are low. And then if after the lettuce get harvested, they go to a, a, an alfalfa field or a cotton field, then it doesn't matter that that thrip can be infected, but it's not going to infect the, the cotton and it's going to die, and that's how a lot of the, the virus get lost, gets lost in the environment because we have all these other crops that don't care about INSV. I don't think we're saying that forever that's going to happen. I'm saying uh, last year it didn't happen, and this summer it didn't seem to happen. It might happen next year. Depends on how much INSV we have and how much it spreads. Yeah, we might start seeing it in the weeds in the date orchards. Well, let, let, me, let me bring up another, another question. And you're the man to talk to. With this water situation, especially out east, and let's say those guys get their water cut in half, are they, they're going to modify what they farm, right? Particularly maybe in the summer. So we could just assume that alfalfa acres might be down, sedan acres might be down, blah, blah, blah. How's that going to change the dynamic? You know, that was my question. Is it going to force more thrips into other plants like lettuce in the winter? But it still leaves, it's still that summer dynamic there. Or is, is alfalfa actually helping us? Is it a trap crop? I don't know. That's, uh, that's a question I have. I don't well, know. I mean, what you, what you put up there, and you're, you're the one, it's coming through the transplants. There, it is not making it through the summer, and it's only, re, it's only reinfecting here through those transplants. It sure seems like that. I, I, how, what other conclusion can you come to? And see, we have so much more alfalfa than you do in Imperial Valley, we just don't have the incidence line. I would see you. And, yeah. So I mean, we, we have 100,000 acres, but we do not have the incidence that you guys have. You know? and, 
and it's if we do haven't had the rains the last few years, you know, so we don't have that corridor through San Felipe Walk down the mountain, bringing the bagrata bug. We don't have the thrips, uh, and, and, and the economics this year changed that also because we're cutting that hay in such a quick schedule that our, our thrip populations aren't building up in the hay this year like they did last year with no hay market. Mm -hmm. They were really bad last year, and we still didn't have it going into, into this uh, October November lettuce market. In, uh, one thing I noticed, and this is a different crop, but about six or seven years ago, there was a fouling program up on the Yuma Mesa. And if you, were if you had a citrus grove next to a fallow field, your citrus strip populations were a lot higher. And that was because the adjacent fallow fields, they're a lot drier. So you have a drier environment, you're going to have higher thrift populations. If you have more humidity in an area, you're going to have fewer populations like romaine lettuce that's on a sandier block usually the thrip numbers are higher it dries down quicker and the thrip becomes more abundant and that's what i've seen many imperials more humid or humidity levels are rather where the thrip's not as abundant good point john are you cycling out high in this v i mean if alfalfa's not a hose and melons on a hose and van's not a hose and the life cycle will be like 20 days or something as long as we get rid of the weeds, it has no place to host, so that you know, virus is just gone until we reintroduce it. That's what I think. I think it's, I don't, Daniel's data and the stuff we collected last year really shows that. I mean, you just don't see it in, in the landscape, if you will. Um, certainly not in the agronomic crops that aren't supposedly hosts, and then certainly in these weeds that are susceptible hosts. I, in the back of my mind, I also think that this time of the year, this high heat that we get, and maybe it's because it dries down the weed so fast, but we just don't see thrips under high heat. It's, it's almost like once that temperature starts to moderate down to the 80 to 70, all of a sudden they start moving and they start, and they reproductively, at least based on what we see in those samples, they do much better uh, population wise. So I don't know, but if you look at the scientific literature, they do at 30 degrees Celsius, which is an average of 86, that's where their peak development is, where they're just cranking uh, development wise. But it doesn't necessarily equate to our summers here. You'd think of the alfalfa in July, maybe late June, you'd just, they'd be going crazy, but they, they really don't under that high temperature. So again, another factor that I have no explanation for. Is that <laughs> you do find, you do find a lot of predators, some uh, aureus, you see a lot of aureus sometimes, but they, don't, they can't stop the, I mean, you find more aureus because you find a lot more thrip. It just doesn't seem, especially if you get them in a lettuce, uh, like organic lettuce, you see a lot of aureus. But um, they can't keep up with it. It doesn't seem like they can keep up with them. So is the, is the incidence low enough that we don't bitch about those transplants that are coming in here? Is it worth creating a firestorm with our, sh our shippers, growers that are bringing plants in, or is it a low enough incidence and, and, and instigating a, a, a whatever through the states, a quarantine or whatever, or is it incidence low enough that we let it go? From what we've seen so far, I mean, I, w I would say, you know, as long as you're aware of, if, if you're putting transplants in, in this block, and I think a lot of the guys that knew they were coming in, at least the guys I talked with, they hammered them, and then the stuff around them, it, take, it seems like it took so long for it to spread, and guys were just managing thrips for, for cosmetic injury anyway, as well. It just never seemed to blow up. I'm trying to think, the, the worst field I saw in the season was, um, what was the worst field? It was only like 6%, and that's, that's compared to what these guys see in Salinas, that's, that's nothing. And, I don't know. I think awareness is be, as, as good as anything. I know I would never recommend pro prohibiting transplants. I mean, those are, you know, as long as you know what you're getting into. And we, our recommendations say treat those dang things the minute they hit the ground. You know, be, aggr be aggressive around them, too. That's, that's my thoughts. I may be wrong, but that's kind of what I think. Why can't we grow transplants locally? Why can't we grow romaine transplants locally? You can't grow enough of them locally. Can and there are growing, but uh, there's a there's a lot. And some people are sourcing from other areas other than Salinas. 
go out of that area in those hot spots in, the, in those time periods. Get away from and it's not just the romaine plants that they're coming in on, they also are hitching a ride on the broccoli and cauliflower plants mm -hmm. You just and jumping off of there. And just because they're on the plant doesn't mean they don't have INSV on them. I, I mean. Mm -hmm. what, what about celery? Because celery can't be produced here. Did we ever figure out if celery was a host? I don't think so. Uh, now, now, you know what is, and I, I made the mistake of not sampling it, is spinach. They say, isn't that right, Stephanie? Spinach, spinach is, a, is a, a host. asymptomatic host. There's a lot of spinach around. But, but that's all direct seeded, too. So, so be, it, be aware of what's there. Be aware downwind, around it, whatever. And, and yeah. Question, you ever any calls from Mexico that people are growing in Tony's conditions, coastal conditions, that don't have this problem in the summertime like, like he has? I mean, why aren't, why aren't you getting calls about that, or Selena's getting calls about INSB down there? Well, you know, I just got an email from a student down somewhere in Mexico. I didn't even recognize the university, and he, he's doing his senior project, and he wants to come learn about INSV. And I've, I basically said, well, you really need to go to Salinas if you want to learn about INSV. So my, my gut, to, I haven't talked to him personally, but it could be that it's starting to pop up in some areas down there. I don't know. Just the conditions are so much more where they don't have a long summer. And he's got three months with no host weeds around here. And, you know, but when you start finding the first transplants, those levels are seven out of ten that you're trying to your sample. That's a high end. So, so they, you do find it in Imperial. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Find it's it? very light uh, along, the, along the edge of the desert, mostly, and some out of the south end, uh, because I think it's prevailing wind for the best time of year. But it has been like, even where trips are heavy, mm -hmm. incidents is light. And it, like you said, because of the drought, we have cleaner weeds and ditch banks and what, I, what not. But that we're definitely host free a lot better than we would have been behind an El Nino. And when there's an El Nino year, I think this thing's going to really blow up. <laughs> You guys have been getting hammered the last couple of weeks, haven't you? Yeah, no, hardly any. No? When I drive around here, I was really surprised. Got a little bit of the edge of the desert where it is. It's like a half mile by half mile. It's very, very light. Well, you know, that's a good point. I did, the, uh, I did all the weather data. And since, last, the beginning of, since the end of last monsoon until now, our weather station here, 0.14 inches of rain. We've had almost no rain in the last... Basically, um, 12 well, up until this this recent, but even these storms haven't been hitting us very hard. But so we went through the whole produce season with basically no rain. Yeah. And hot, and dry, and windy like it was. The mildew situation was so much lighter. Never so we anticipated high mite pressure, high thrift pressure, and it just wasn't there. I think that was the economics of the alfalfa. That kind of schedules were so tight, so early, mm -hmm. it just never built up in the springtime. I'll tell you this: when I do my my samples and. It's getting close to harvest, and there's five percent bloom. Maybe in some of the, it's like now when the, it's only growing that big and it's full of blooms. There's all kinds of thrips, as you can imagine. So those cutting that would make that would make sense with that cutting cycle. Okay, um, I have one last thing that I'm going to do, and that is give you a demo of these amino strips. And so we have these kits for you, um, if you want them. And what they are is they're the, the Agdia amino strips. And the reason why we have these is because these people, these companies sponsored these kits. Um, so thanks so much to all of these companies for, and all the reps who like just immediately said yes to sponsoring. It was, it was very generous. So, okay, so we put together these kits and there's, there's uh, these tubes with five amino strips. These need to keep dry, so keep them well sealed in here. Um, there's, so there's the tube, there's five of these bags, and there's also five of these um, pieces of paper. And so what we're trying to do is to track incidence of INSV this year. So if you get a positive, if you could just, you can either write on here, take a picture, and there's a little QR code that brings you to a site where you can upload the picture, or you can just go through the QR code and do, there's a little survey, same information, you can just fill it out online. And what we're doing is we're gonna have a raffle, and John has, is donating several of his hats, I don't know how many, but I think he said like 10 hats, and then, and we're also gonna have like a grand prize, we'll have a t-shirt, and you know, maybe a mug, so 
We're trying to bribe you to give us your positive results. So please. Um, and even if you don't, if you run out of your kits, if you want to send us um, more positives, that would be good. And we probably will have some left over because so many people left. And so now we'll have some extra kits. So if you finish and you need a new kit, just contact us and we might have some extras. Okay, so to use these, so you get these bags. And these bags are, um, they, they have the, the buffer in them already, and then there's a mesh bag inside, and that's a grinding bag. So all you have to do to open the bag is you just cut around where the bottom of the label is. There's instructions on, I just wanna show you one. So I just have purslane, but with, if you're working with a lettuce plant, you just wanna use scissors, and you wanna go for symptomatic tissue, because the symptomatic tissue will be the one that you'll be more likely to get a positive with. Um, so you want to cut out about a one inch um, piece of tissue and if you are wanting to do something like a weed and it has many small leaves, what I would do is just take leaves from several parts of the plant just to make it more likely that you'll get a positive. So you open up the bag and the sample goes in the, inside the mesh. And then you can use, I like to use scissors. You just use the scissor handle and you just rub. And you don't have to worry about being too careful because it won't, the bag's pretty sturdy. And then so you just, it grinds it up. And then you let it sit for three minutes. I'm not gonna make you sit for three minutes. I have a, a I'm Julia Childs. Here's my one in the oven. <laughs> Okay, so you take your strip out of here. And so there's a little channel right here that doesn't have the mesh bag. And so you stick, so you don't wanna to touch the green part. You, you stick it in that channel. And so this is just like, you know, those COVID tests everyone's been taken. You need to have the liquid flow through. So you wanna stick it in the liquid, but you don't want any liquid to get in the side. And you just let it, kind of suck it up and then you'll see this will actually this one this one's a positive so what you can do is you know as you're leaving you can come up and look at these one of these will be positive and one will be negative and so it could take up to 30 minutes to get a result but honestly I've never had to wait 30 minutes for a result usually you can tell within a couple of minutes